Amy give us a welcome and some updates, and then we have a couple of presentations and a round table. Um, but first, I kind of wanted to introduce our procurement committee. Um, I had kind of failed to do that yesterday. Sorry, everyone. Um, so I am the current chair for the AZ Water Procurement Committee. And then our vice chair is Jolene Montoya from City of Flagstaff. And then we have our secretary, Ashley Pinnell from City of Buckeye. Our outreach coordinator is Chris Kirilluk from Fountain Hills. And then we have our workshop subcommittee chair, Dave Nye from City of Glendale. Um, I'm from City of Phoenix, so we have um, a bunch of representation throughout the valley um, and outside the valley in Flagstaff and kind of Fountain Hills in Buckeye. I don't know. It's all a big metro mess here. <laughs> um, so that's your current pre-treatment committee. Um, and then um, Amy Baker is to be or doing her welcome. So Amy is our a director on the board of AZ Water, and she is our environmental council liaison, as well as the annual conference planning committee chair. So um, we are glad to have her um, welcoming us today. Thanks. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, good morning and welcome to day two of the AZ Water pretreatment and fog workshop. As Chelsea said, uh, my name is Amy Baker and I'm with the city of Glendale. Um, I'm an environmental program manager. Um, the workshop today um, is going to be great. Yesterday was awesome. Um, if you're local and you are not on the uh, pretreatment or fog committee, I highly recommend you become an AZ water member and get onto this committee. Um, using me as an example, um, I've been in the water industry about 18 or 19 years. Um, I was a chemist for uh, 13 of those years, and then I became a supervisor over um, pretreatment and over stormwater and wastewater quality permits, and um, I turned to this committee, and it's basically where I got most of my experience and knowledge, um, well, my knowledge, and so, you know, it's a great resource to have. Um, the leadership committee is amazing and, and they rotate through, um, but just the committee members and their meetings are amazing. So if you are joining this workshop, you are learning a ton, but they also have meetings that if you're a member, you can uh, join in on those meetings and a ton of networking. It's amazing. Um, so I highly recommend that if you're not local, um, we are happy that you are here, that you're supporting us and that you're learning from us. Right now in this virtual environment, you technically, you know, could still join in on everything that we do. But I know if we ever get back to a point where we can meet in person, uh, you'd be missing out on some of those uh, networking uh, moments, which again, I think are amazing. Um, Chelsea also membered that uh, mentioned that I am the planning chair for the AZ Water uh, Conference Planning Committee and if you were on yesterday, Doug gave a very lengthy plug for the conference, so I, do, I didn't intend on even giving that lengthy of a plug, so I'm not going to repeat what he said. Um, and I'm not going to put a link in the comments because I don't want you to click on that link and browse through that during today's workshop, but um, just write down azwater.org. If you go to azwater.org, there will be a banner at the top and um, a rotating banner, click on the conference. It'll take you to the conference page. And if you go to the drop down for uh, conference info, you can find the brochure and it's a draft brochure. Some things have changed, but there's about um, 70, over 70 hours of content that's gonna be available. Um, the conference is April 6th through the 8th um, with some live and some pre-recorded content. But then all of that content, even the live stuff will be recorded and will be available through April 30th. Um, so if you need PDHs, you know, this is great for those of you out of state. If you don't have an MA um, in order to um, get PDHs, uh, this is a great opportunity for that because you could get potentially 70 PDHs. It's pretty great. So um, azwater.org. Again, click through, follow conference stuff, and um, consider registering. Um, 
And then I just want to thank the team for the pre-treatment committee because you guys do an awesome job. <laughs> um, you've always been a great network for me, and I know I don't work in pre-treatment anymore, but um, but it's been it's been awesome having you guys as a network. So I will pass it back to Chelsea so she can introduce the first uh, speaker. Hello again. Um, actually, I think I'm going to have Dave um, introduce our first speaker for today, as I believe he has a blurb. OK, can you hear me? All right, I'm going to give you yes. housekeeping issues first. Uh, just a, a re reminder, uh, everyone, please make sure you are muted. And uh, if you're on your cell phone, uh, you're, you're muted as well. That way we don't get the uh, entertainment value of listening to you talk to someone else in the room. Um, and then we are going to be doing the first one is going to be amalgam separators today. We'll have a short break. Um, come back with another one. Why regulate non SIUs? Another quick short break and then we'll follow it up by a round table. So that's the plan for today. Uh, but with that, the first one is amalgam separators. Uh, today, we're lucky to have Trisha Vogel, who's the owner of the website amalgam-separator.com. Her company's mission is to provide dental offices with the best amalgam separator brands at the lowest prices. They are specialists in helping dental offices find the right separator to fit their needs and offer products that are both mandated and approved by the EPA that dentists, uh, to ensure dentists do not contaminate wastewater with mercury and other hazardous materials. So with that, uh, I'm happy to welcome today, Trisha Vogel. Hi, good morning. Thanks, Dave. All right, I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started. Okay. Can everybody see? No. No? Okay. Hmm. Okay. There you go. Are we good? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, dental amalgam separators. What is a dental amalgam separator? An amalgam separator is a filtration device that's placed between the dental operatory and the vacuum pump. Its purpose is to capture mercury and other hazardous materials that would otherwise be discharged with wastewater back into the environment. Although most dental offices currently use some type of basic filtration system to reduce the amount of mercury solids passing into the sewer system, Dental offices are the single largest source of mercury at sewage treatment plants. There is now a federal mandate that dental practices obtain an amalgam separator and an amalgam bucket for placing other large dental wastes in order to be compliant. The amalgam separator and bucket you see here are by Salmetics. They are the leader in the US, the most popular. Amalgam bucket, there's really no technology in that. It's just a plastic bucket that can screw closed. They um, can place extracted teeth, chair side traps, other things like that. Even smaller chair side amalgam separators can go in that bucket as well. Okay, so the requirements that the dentists must meet is that they have a certified ISO 11143 amalgam separator. This means that it has a filtration rate over 95%. They must have an amalgam bucket to place other non-contact and larger sources of amalgam. They need to maintain suction by using a daily evacuation line cleaner specifically formulated for use with amalgam separators. Um, definitely not recommended that they use any bleach products. And uh, they need to submit a one-time compliance report to whoever, whomever their local authority is. And then once they send back their full amalgam separator or bucket, they will receive a certificate of recycling from the uh, recycling facility. 
The EPA has left compliance rules to the POTWs by establishing that dental dischargers are not significant industrial users or categorical industrial users in the final rule. The EPA has eliminated the application of specific oversight and reporting requirements, such as permitting and annual inspections of dental dischargers, unless the control authority chooses to apply these requirements. So they don't require you to identify every dentist in your town to make sure that they are complying. They just require the dentist to let you know that they are. This means that the control authorities have discretion under the final rule to determine the appropriate manner of oversight, compliance assistance, and enforcement. There is a document by the EPA called Frequently Asked Questions for Control Authorities on the Dental Rule that gives a lot more detail on this, and I've linked that at the end. So why has the EPA required dentists to have an amalgam separator? Uh, for years, the ADA had been pushing for dentists to do this just because it's great for the environment. And before the rule was in effect in 2017, it was estimated that about only 40% of dentists had an amalgam separator. There were many states that mandated it before it became a federal rule. So mercury is a highly toxic element that's found both naturally and as an introduced contaminant in the environment. Pregnant women and children are the most susceptible to mercury poisoning. Dental clinics are the main source of mercury discharges to POTWs. The EPA estimates about 103,000 dental offices use or remove amalgam in the United States, and almost all of these send their wastewater to POTWs. The EPA expects compliance with this final rule will annually reduce the discharge of mercury by 5.1 tons, as well as 5.3 tons of other metals found in waste dental amalgam to PODWs. There's a lot of negative health effects caused by short and long time exposure to mercury. Here's an illustration of the mercury cycle in the environment. Mercury is constantly recycled into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, mining, burning of garbage, and contamination from POTWs, creating a chemical oxidation that results in mercury being sent back down through precipitation. It's also found in the ground soil from natural sources. Small fish then eat the grubs and plants that are high in mercury longer lived predatory fish then consume these fish and the mercury accumulates in these body their bodies when humans digest amounts of these fish such as king mackerel marlin orange ruffy shark swordfish tilefish ahi tuna and big eye tuna we consume mercury as well any any moms in the group would know that when they were expecting that these were all on the no eat list do all dental professionals need an amalgam separator? There are some exceptions. Dental offices that discharge to POTWs that do not place or remove amalgam need to only submit a one-time certification stating that they don't. Dental dischargers that exclusively practice oral pathology, oral and maxillofacial radiology, oral and maxillofacial surgery, orthodontics, periodontics, prosthodontics, they don't need them and mobile units and dental facilities that do not discharge their amalgam process wastewater into a POTW are also not subject to any of the rules requirements. For example, dental facilities that discharge amalgam process wastewater into a septic tank or a holding tank. Amalgam separators remove amalgam particles from the wastewater through centrifugation, sedimentation, filtration, or a combination of any of these methods. Practically all amalgam separators on the market today rely on sedimentation because of its effectiveness and operational simplicity. Brand examples of these different types of separators are sedimentation units, Salmetics, and the R&D amalgam collector. The R&D amalgam collector has actually been around since the 1970s. It was invented by a dentist in Washington state. It's uh, fairly simple to use. One, they don't have a filter. The dentist has to physically separate the upper chamber and then dump the sludge, as we call it, into an amalgam bucket for recycling. So it's pretty 
inexpensive way for them to do it, but it's also pretty gross. Um, then they have filtration units. These two units pictured are chair side models. They don't require a central vacuum system that most dentists have. You'll see chair side units in a smaller dentist, just one or two chairs, one dentist, one hygienist type office. So they don't have a full level indicator. They have a maximum use life on these. And these are just filtrations. As the centrifuge unit, this is the Metasys Eco 2. You'll probably see their previous model, the, just called the Eco, that has a blue top and bottom. This is the most popular unit in Europe, and they're becoming more popular in the US as well. And this uses centrifugal force to remove amalgam particles from the wastewater. So as you can see on all these units, they have an inlet. And in all of these models, the water has to be slowed down. And once it slows down, it filters out and all the sedimentation that's heavier than water stays at the bottom and the waste clean wastewater exits the system. And then the last unit is the Liberty Boss. This uses ion exchange sedimentation and filtration. This allows the equipment to remove tiny amalgam particles and dissolve mercury as well. And this is a unit that can be good for up to three years if you have a small dental office, no filters, they just exchange the entire unit. Oh, dental offices that have installed amalgam separators must keep maintenance reports. This includes how many separator filters were exchanged per year and where those filters were sent for recycling. Most dental amalgam separator manufacturers require a filter cartridge to be replaced after one year. How often they need to change the filters depends on the number of dental operatories in the office, as well as the frequency of amalgam removal. They are also closed system separators, such as Liberty Boss, that don't use filters and have a max service life based on the number of operatories in the office. If your dentist is using a lot of filters, um, they're paying a lot of money for this. So it really depends on their use, what system is best for them. Printer, the It's like the printer industry. The printer itself doesn't cost a lot, but the ink does. And that's similar to how the most popular amalgam separator companies operate as well. For smaller dental offices or dentists that do not frequently place or remove amalgam, they may not have a central vacuum system. Those dentists will have the chair side, mobile amalgam separator. They may also use a single separator that connects directly to the high volume evacuator. There is a new product on the market called the Capdol. You can find that on my website. For a dentist that rarely does this. Maybe they're a cosmetic dentist, but they're removing a tooth or removing a filling while they're operating on a patient. They can use a product that they just put on the end of the evacuator, which is the suction tip, and it gets thrown out after that single use. And it is ISO certified. It's not allowed in all states right now, but I believe it is allowed in Arizona. So the dentist needs to use a certain type of line cleaner that's not oxidizing or acidic and that has a pH no higher than eight or lower than six. In their lines, uh, it's not just dental amalgam that's coming out. What's coming out of the mouth is saliva, profi paste, toothpaste, anything that, and that all goes into the amalgam separator. So it's not what you see in a full separator is not just dental am amalgam. It's a mix of the harmful chemicals, as well as just everything. So it's hazardous material, it's pretty nasty stuff. So here's some issues to look out for. In this picture, to fix suction issues, the plumber completely disconnected the neglected amalgam separator. As you can see from the top left of the amalgam separator, it just has a fern co on it. It's not connected to anything. So they're not filtering amalgam at all, and it's not sealed. So there's also methyl mercury gases escaping. The loss of suction was only due to the office not maintaining the amalgam separator. There are certified dental technicians that install these. It's not something that a, pl a, a layman plumber would have knowledge of unless they are a specialist in the dental field. Okay, so separator is full. Most separators have a clear cartridge with an easy to see fill level. 
For separators that are not clear, it can be determined they are full when there is a loss of suction and or it has reached the manufacturer's recommended use life. PPE should always be worn when changing filters. Check for used cartridges laying around the office as well. It's hazardous waste and it must be sent to a recycling facility. That is one of the rules the dentists have to follow to stay compliant. So in these pictures, this is all just neglect of the amalgam separators not being changed out when they're full. So the system goes into overflow where the top part is full of the sludge and it's not dropping down into the filter. There's cracks and leaking can occur. Uh, improper maintenance can cause toxic spills and a total system failure. The entire unit needs to be replaced if there are any cracks. So these are uh, two examples of a neglected systems. Definitely don't want to see tape on an amalgam separator. They are just made of plastic, a thick plastic, but they can break if they're not taken care of. The last picture on the right is one of the R&D. That R&D, what I had mentioned earlier, is the one that the dentist has to manually dump the amalgam waste into an amalgam bucket, and it just uses clips to keep the top and bottom section together. So if they have a clip not clipped, the entire unit can just separate and the amalgam waste would spill everywhere. So conclusion, the EPA final rule for effluent limitations, guidelines, and standards for the dental category was in effect on July 14th, 2017, with dentists needing to comply by July 14th of 2020. At amalgamseparator.com, we are happy to be a resource for dentists to find the best solutions to fit their practice and teach them proper maintenance. And that's it. Thanks, Trisha. Um, no problem. Oh, oh sorry, Dave. sorry, Dave. This is uh, uh, don't like that. I have a question for you, Trisha. Yeah. You're open to the questions. Sure. Um, so, what are the main, I guess, main points when when we go do inspections at dentists to make sure we look at besides? I mean, I, I know you just said like the integrity is not bypassed, the fill line, but since we're not versed like dentists are in, in the maintenance of it, what, do you, what suggestions do you have for us? To be honest, a lot of dentists aren't very well versed in it either. If it's a larger practice, they're going to usually have an office manager taking care of this. Um, just a, an investigative question you could ask them is how ha, how has their suction been? Because this is all tied into the suction. So if they are having problems with suction, there's a problem somewhere. Either their lines are clogged with all of the dental waste that they're not properly cleaning um, or the separator itself is full. Another thing to check for, which would be a little more advanced, is making sure the system is not installed on a bypass. Um, so that like in the first picture where it was completely disconnected, but you may also see improper connection. Those would be two little less obvious things to see. And then also they need to have, they should be able to produce a certificate of recycling, um, especially with cell medics. All the lar anybody that they send the amalgam waste to makes it very easy to have a certificate of that. They're available online, they get it when they do it. When they purchase a new filter, it comes with the return box. That's for all of the amalgam separator brands. So they, it's a prepaid box that they put the old one in that they take the new one out of. So the brands make it very easy for them to stay compliant. I hope that answers your question. That definitely helps. Thank you, Trisha. No problem. Trisha, in the real world, what is the, the the average lifespan for these different units? We'll go to a dental office, and you can see them that they look like they've been there since you know 1970 on some, and some of them are newer. But what is the real estimated lifespan? It truly depends on how many uh, chairs are in the dental office. So. If you look on my website, amalgam-separator.com, I have a page called Compare, and on there I give an estimate 
that the um, manufacturers give, that's a typical use life. So for the Liberty Boss, which doesn't use any filters, it could last up to 36 months if you have um, only one to three chairs in your office. If you have more than 10 chairs, it's only going to last one year. Um, for the chair side models, the smaller units, they're going to last six to eight months max because it's not just the amalgam, like anything they suck out is filling these devices as well. Um, the cap doll is a single use. And then the Cellmedics and the Eco2 for a larger dentist is really going to, if it's about one to four operatories, it's probably going to be six months max on it. The system comes with one and then they require you to, they require the dentist to switch it out within the first year anyway. So they should be using two a year minimum, even if they don't use it a lot. That's just like part of their warranty on the machines for the ones that have the filters. So the Salmedics, you'll see their, their legacy model is the HG5. Now it's the NXT has been out for a couple of years. You will, that's by far the most popular model in the US that you'll find. And it's very easy for the dentist to switch it out themselves. They just unscrew it, it comes with a cap, they mail it out, they put the new one in. If you see that there's a lot of sludge in the upper chamber, the, and the dentist doesn't know what to do about it. So because of that, they've maybe bypassed the amalgam separator. If they just run their vacuum system, to, they can empty, if they have nothing coming in, it'll suck everything out so that they can then safely change out the filter. These really don't, these don't have vacuums on them. They're just a filter. So if there's nothing wrong with the vacuum themselves, as long as these are properly maintained, there's really no broken parts that can happen unless it's just not maintained correctly, not changed when it needs to be. So typically every six months for a, a normal sized dentist. Um, okay, so since we have a little bit of time, I'm thinking that we can have kind of an impromptu round table to discuss like what what municipalities kind of throughout the nation have been how they've been handling this dental rule. Um, obviously, it went into effect several years ago, um, but a lot of um, facility or municipalities have been kind of getting their forms in. Um, I know we have ADQ on the line, which I don't want to put them on the spot, but as a regulatory body over, you know, Arizona, um, they also might have a little bit of insight of kind of how they're required to regulate um, per the EPA. Um, so I'm going to pull up just a little kind of background PowerPoint so we can get the additional discussion going. So one second. So Chelsea, I didn't know if you saw in the chat, there's a question already put out um, about the, how about mobile dental clinics, the rural areas and jails, um, anybody managing those transient dentists? That's a good point. Since EPA didn't said they were exempt, do we have to worry about them? Um, Dave, do you wanna kind of feel that? I'm just fixing this PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah, if I remember correctly, the way the, that the EPA, uh, the new rule reads that mobile dental clinics are exempt from this. I don't believe jails are because I think that's still, it's dependent on um, what type of system they have. And I don't think, I, I wouldn't think that rural areas are exempt either. It's it, it, you, 
it's 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 based on the practice and what and what the type of practice that the dentist has. Now there is that whole list of all the different specialty fields that are exempted. Um, we still sent out here in Glendale um, all the dental survey forms to just about everybody and let them check off the box that said they weren't doing it. Some that were, you know, the maxillofacial surgeons, you know, we, we, we pretty much knew already, but we still sent it out to everybody here just to get a feel and let them fill it out and write and then sign and basically sign their life away that they told us this is what they're doing there because we will eventually go in and inspect them all anyway just to see so but I, I don't see where you know we would go against the epa rule and whether you're in a rural or metropolitan area it's still the dental office it doesn't necessarily separate uh, based on your geographic location does anybody else have a different thought on that or I think Isaiah had his hand up. Yeah, I'm going to let um, Isaiah. Oh, sorry. I see Isaiah has his hand up, so I'll let him go. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. Really appreciate it. Hey, everybody. I'm Isaiah Ortiz. I'm with uh, ADEQ's pre-treatment team. I uh, just want to say great presentations for the last couple of days and really appreciate you all putting this on. And, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. But yeah, um, as far as um, our experience at the state level, um, you know, I think that our cities have done a really great job of of setting up websites. So like the city of Fe the city of Phoenix's website is really good for submitting those one time um, compliance reports uh, per the dental amalgam rule. Um, but yeah, for those, that's a really great question for like the prisons and um, those other authorities that um, are out there. You know, sometimes in the middle of nowhere, um, those facilities are required to report to us as well um, as the um, um, as the state is the control authority wherever an approved uh, pretreatment program does not exist. Um, so, for example, we've had our state prisons um, reporting to us um, for their one time uh, compliance reports as well. Um, and, and so they have they have reported to us. So um, there has been some oversight there. Um, but yeah, and then we, we've also had some facilities that have reached out. And interestingly, we've had some like national um, dental associations where it seems like there's uh, some sort of an association that deals with like multiple dentists like around around the country and they and they reach out specifically to our region and then we just try to point them in the right direction depending on uh which uh service area that they're in so for example if they're located in glendale then we'll point them over to dave's team um however if they're in court site or something like a, a an area where there's not an approved pretreatment program uh we go ahead and, and send them the adeq form so um, it's definitely been a, a team effort and a team left. I mean, we've had things referred both from our cities and and from the EPA and um, from all over. So, um, but yeah, that's just want to put my two cents in there. Thanks, Isaiah. Uh, we had another question in the chat um, about what database has everyone been using to find the dental offices in your area? So I know in my experience, I pretty much used like the ADA uh, website to find what's in my area. And then I used Google and kind of just since we're a smaller town and smaller in quotes, <laughs> town and some in, the, in Arizona that I mean, we, we kind of know what's out here because we drive around town doing our inspections. So anybody else? Randy? Randy, you can um, go. I think your hand's up. <laughs> Can't hear you. Hmm. Randy, I can't hear you, so maybe try typing in the chat.
I just included a link on the chat um, that goes to the EPA's document for frequently asked questions for control authorities on the dental rule. So that has um, all the information really specific to the requirements of the treatment facility. And then somebody asked if there's any oh, pump out clean out requirements. Um, so yeah, when it's full, yeah. when they've reached their fill level Close indicator, that That's needs to go. Yeah. And in order to be considered yeah, a valve separator, it separator, it has to be yeah. ISO certified. This is also in the rule it out. that it's ISO certified. So it can't, they've always been amalgam separators. They were never called, if it, if it doesn't have an ISO certificate, it was never sold as an amalgam separator. So if somebody has one, it's going to be ISO certified, which means it filters at least 95% of particles out. One interesting thing in the dental rule, it says that, um, Dentists that currently have a working amalgam separator can keep it for up to 10 years or its use life, whichever comes first. There are no amalgam separators that are going to last 10 years. Um, you have to change out the filters anyway. So if you see anything that looks really old, it's going to need to be replaced. It's plastic. It's got water running through it all the time. This line cleaners and other materials that's going to break it down. So. You, sh you shouldn't see anything too old in an office. Brandy, did you get your uh, sand working? Uh, I still can't hear you. I'm going to call on Josh. You have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I was going to say when I so when I was working for Memphis, we we did this. Uh, we went through this exercise of the identification of all the dental facilities, and we found that the ADA list was not uh, very inclusive. It only included maybe about 50 percent of the dentists in the in the Memphis area, and um, so so we kind of used the combination of uh, the ADA list and then the state of Tennessee's. Um, dental license registry and and we actually found that there were between those two lists there were still some dentists that we missed and uh, which is which is a little concerning um, from a licensure perspective um, but then we also uh, found a company that and I can't remember the name I'll try and find the information and, and forward it out but we actually purchased a list of, of dentists that seemed to be by far the most inclusive, and it was relatively inexpensive, um, but but it, it was by far our best source, um, just a private entity that kind of focuses on, you know, identifying and locating um, specific medical um, practices. So that that's just kind of my experience with it. Um, we have a question from Diana about, um, she, she asks, is ADAQ requiring cities conduct annual inspections on all dental facilities? Your supervisor asked her about that due to resources. Um, we could extend this to like any, you know, state body, I guess, but um, Isaiah, I don't know if you want to answer that. I don't believe that that's a requirement. Or Randy, you can try if you have sound. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, hey, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. um, going back to the, we, I used three sources myself. The Arizona uh, Dental Association. We have a website that lists them all. I also just Googled uh, dentistry in City of Surprise. And then um, I went and have a the capability of linking up businesses, business licenses within the city of Surprise. So those are the three sources um, that I was able to use and it gave me a pretty comprehensive list. So if you have access to those, that's the best way to do it. Uh, and then we now, when we have new dentists 
trying to come in our concept in our concept review meetings we give them a link so they can do it online and fill it out so those are the three that seem to work the best for us thanks randy um okay i'm going to go back to the other question that diana had and isaiah if you want to um chime in and then there's another good one that ashley asked so she can go right after yeah, that's a great question, Diana. I'm not sure right off the bat. Um, let me do a little bit of searching right now and and see if there's a required inspection frequency. Um, I'm not sure, so I don't want to give any misleading information since we have a lot of folks on the call. So if we could circle um, back on that one, that'd be great. <laughs> I was going to have um, a little bit of input on there, but we'll wait. Um, Ashley, her question is, how are you guys handling dental ownership changes and finding them? Do you need a new OTCR if the takeover um, an existing dental office and purchase the legal ownership? That's a really good question, too. Um, <clears throat> I know in Phoenix, you know, we've got it took a while to get all the forms back. Um, but that is a good question. Um, Trisha, you can, if you have a response. Yeah, it is in the final rule. Um, find what port. It is in the 40 CFR 403.12. It says, if a dental practice changes ownership, which is a change in the responsible party as defined in 40 CFR 403.12, the new owner must submit a one-time compliance report. It doesn't mean that they have to buy new equipment, but yes, they do need to submit a one-time compliance report that contains the required information. That is specifically mentioned in the EPA rule. Perfect, thanks. No problem. Hey, and this is Josh again. One thing I'll mention about in inspection, sampling, things like that at, at dental facilities that I've seen just kind of across the country is that so so the way the regulation is written, the dental facilities are not SIUs, they're not CIUs, um, but they are you know considered non-domestic users um, and, and are are regulated as such. But it, it specifically in in the preamble of of the regulation. Um, in the development documents, it states that, um, you know, because they're not an SIU, because they're not a CIU, you're not required to permit them. Um, and, and so if you look at the federal uh, regulations that at, at 4.3.8 um, 4 that require us as pretreatment programs to go out and perform monitoring and oversight, that, that, sp that annual sampling, annual inspection, um, specifically is required for significant industrial users. So um, just just be aware that from a national, I'm not, not speaking specifically for Arizona because each state can handle this differently, but nationally speaking, um, they're not SIUs, they're not CIUs, uh, they're just considered industrial users and therefore from a compliance with federal regulations, there is no um, sampling or inspection requirements um, as far as the way the regulations are written? Um, that's a good answer. Uh, so I know originally when we were looking at it, <laughs> I think I kind of got a little worried because, you know, it does say they are an industrial user. However, um, you know, municipalities don't necessarily permit all industrial users um, depending on what they're doing and the risks of the sewer. Um, so in Phoenix, you know, we do the certification like we're required to, but the way our program is split, we have, you know, our industrial pretreatment, and then we have our fat soils and grease, and then kind of other, um, like some smaller breweries or some other industries of concern. And we, you know, we don't permit, we don't have any permitted dental offices, except, um, if some of our larger hospitals, they they have separate, you know, they might have a dental clinic, um, like RBA hospital, they have a dental, um, one of our other federal hospitals, they have a dental clinic. Um, so, you know, 
technically it's regulated as an SAU, but not specifically because of that dental rule. Um, it just happens to encompass it. Um, Isaiah, do you have, you can go. <laughs> okay, thank you. I saw that Trisha had her hand raised as well as she, I don't wanna step over Oops. her if she. Um, no, no, good. Sure. You can go and then Trisha can chime in. Um, having a hard time hearing you, Isaiah. Okay, so audio. How you better? You can type. Okay. <laughs> You can type, and then Trisha, can you um, whatever you were gonna say, you can go. <laughs> no, that was just from earlier, but um, yeah, it's really up to the EPA has said that uh, the control authorities can make their own rules because, as others have mentioned, the amount of resources it would take to have somebody inspect every dentist in their town is a lot. So it's up to the dentist at the end of the day to make sure they're they're staying compliant and the epa rule supersedes any of the the state rules thanks um we have some more comments in here about um depending you know make sure you check your sewer use ordinance um, you might have specific requirements um especially for dental rules uh and there might be minimum inspection requirements in your serious ordinance, depending, you know, if it's permanent facility or not. Um, thanks, Travis. And um, also we have somebody um, saying, you know, the rule went back and forth and our, the procurement committee made sure that, you know, these dental offices wouldn't be considered SIUs because of the resources. I think that's definitely accurate. Um, let's see, we have Isaiah said the dentists are not CIUs or SAUs, so they do not need the annual inspection. Exactly. Um, they do need to have documents ready and the separator available for inspection. Um, and obviously any local regulations like under the sewer use ordinance. Um, so I know like in our, in city of Phoenix, you know, like I said, we have our program separated into industrial per treatment and then fog or commercial inspection. So they do periodically go and check um, some of these dental offices. Also any, you know, SIU hospitals we have, we'll take a look and make sure that they're maintaining their separators, which, you know, Trisha's presentation was very helpful in determining um, kind of like maintenance, frequency, what you need to look for. Um, Jolene, here, uh, you can talk about it. <laughs> oh, no, I was, just, I was gonna throw it to the, the group of whether or not anybody's come up with a, like a good inspection checklist, because I've been working on one and trying to figure out what exactly, you know, we need to have on there for when we go inspect. And if anybody's come up with a good one, like they've been using, if they've been inspecting for a while that they found is really good. Cause I, I'm kind of going back and forth considering the different models of separators that are going to be at the dentist of do I need one for each kind or because of the preventative of maintenance might be different on each model so I want to know if anybody had one that they could share or anything that worked for them Trisha go ahead I just linked in the chat a um, checklist. This was made by Mars Biomed. They're the people that manufacture the Liberty Boss. And um, they have created an inspection checklist, which I just linked in there, that has most of the models that you'll find in the field. And it also has a good, the, the second page of it gives an estimate on how often you should be seeing that their filters are changed out 
It has the Psalmatics, Air Techniques Acadia is another popular one. It has the Metasys, the R&D, and the Liberty Boss, and um, Apavia. I haven't seen that one before, but they're typically all about the same. The more dentist operatory chairs are in use, the more filters they're going to use. So, and it also has a um, just a regular checklist on the front page, how often they're cleaning using the line cleaners, how many chairs, how many ops, how many are just for hygienists. So um, yeah, this is from Mars Biomed. If, some, if you wanted to make your own based on this, it's a really good start. Yeah, I started sharing it just so we can all kind of view. So I got another question too of, has anybody um, run into this or have a sewer ordinance or something to the fact of like if a dentist left town and the practice is no longer going to be used as a dentist office, are you holding the dentist responsible for cleaning out all that hazardous waste and stuff like that? Or, or does anybody, have anybody had that happen? Um, the Albuquerque Water Authority, we kind of built it into our one-time compliance reports. So when we have them sign those and agree to all the rules from the EPA, uh, we also included a section. John, can, sorry, I have a kid going to school too. Um, we kind of wrote that in where they're kind of agreeing to take responsibility for that amalgam waste when they're leaving the facility. Hmm, um, Richard or Dave? Richard or Dave, you want to pipe in? Yeah, sorry, I was just reading what Richard is writing. The, uh, the only thing I would say in, in a comment to Jolene is I, I don't know how, I guess in the, in the real world, we, we would have no way of knowing when a dental office moved out. And generally speaking, when that happens, um, you've got another leasee that's coming in to take over a facility and whether they take it or not, we, you know, we, we wouldn't even know it until a new business went in there and the new permits came in or the new plans came across our desk for a TI for tenant improvement that we would be looking at. So a dental office, Jolene, could move out and we would never know about it until we do our next inspection. Um, here I know they've been annually inspecting the dental offices for years. So that would be when we would catch it, but otherwise there, there's really no way to know. Yeah, Dave, I, I'm in the same I'd be in the same situation because we don't always know when they, they move out either. If there's no uh, no change of use, I guess, so to speak. I, and this is Josh again. One one thing that I've I've heard uh, Jam Picker at EPA headquarters say, and this is. You know, this is a little bit easier to regulate than it is to implement, I think. Um, it's they expect that through your industrial user survey um, process, whether that's kind of an ongoing process, whether it's kind of a annually or every couple of years, you really do a thorough deep dive. I think that's when they anticipate that that you, you know, really dig deep and try and identify all industrial users. Because that's if you look at 403, that's what the federal regs state uh, with respect to industrial user surveying that you have to identify and locate all industrial users and notify them of of their applicable uh, pretreatment standards. And, and so I think that you know from a federal perspective that that's kind of what they're looking for is that through an IU survey uh, pr 
process that you're going to identify any new um, any new users. You know, maybe maybe it's the scenario that you've mentioned. One dentist has moved out, and another one's taken over the facility. You know, I, I think that 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 the process at which EPA anticipates you would identify that facility. And somebody mentioned building code. That's actually a good point. Coordinating with your building code or plumbing code um and and requiring that before they sign off on those facilities uh that that they have submitted all the required paperwork and then another one is coordinating with business local business license um because all i think generally speaking all dental facilities would be required to have a business license within the city or the county um depending on the the jurisdiction and so before they would sign off on granting that business license that they would be required to submit uh, the required paperwork. I, I've seen a couple of municipalities do it that way, and it, it takes a lot of the legwork off the pretreatment program and, and puts it on some different departments. But it, it, if you have good relationships with those departments, uh, from what I've seen, it, it, it's worked pretty well and has been successful. Thanks. Um... Let's see. Um, does anybody else have any more kind of comments or like roundtable topics related to this? If not, I'm thinking that we can take our break just a little bit early. Um, we can run our the break will be from nine to nine fifteen. So just a little bit earlier, and then we'll resume back at 9.15, and then um, Josh Ballantin will do his presentation. So we'll just move everything up by 15 minutes, if that is good with everyone. That works. Okay, and then we'll get back to a couple of these questions right shortly after the break. So see everyone back at 9.15 and stay tuned. Thank you, Tricia, for the presentation. Yes, thank you. This is very informative.
press test. I heard, I heard you, Richard. Oh, I guess the first time I, uh, yeah, I was said a whole spiel after Dave, and then uh, right in the middle of it, somebody jumped in, and I was like, did somebody just cut me off? But then my volume was down to nothing on my mic. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, You're this person. <laughs> sorry, Chelsea. You guys do get to hear me now. <laughs> hey, it makes it easier for us so we don't have to read that much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I historically talk a lot of these things anyway. I uh, I try to make an active uh, active concerted effort to uh, not let other people talk. I, I think my voice has been heard on a lot of these things over the last uh, five years, so it's good to hear it from somebody else sometimes. Competitive speakers, <laughs> competitive speakers. <laughs> Richard, we can just go in and mute you <laughs> as you're talking. <laughs> oh, I mute myself. I mean, I can try to keep oh. myself muted. And Amy, since you're on there, now I know why all that, uh, all those nasty messages were going around about you on social media in the last five minutes because you spelled a name wrong. <laughs> Dude, I did that. To, I did that to Rosie too uh, um, at ADEQ just because I type so fast and like emails take me forever to write just because I have so many like misspelled words. And so, yeah, when I do this on these teams meetings, I always have errors and it's like so frustrating. <laughs> yeah, um, I've uh, completely went against using voice to text because for some reason my voice or my cadence just, it says completely the opposite of what I say. It says like completely random things. And uh, Tricia, if you're out there, uh, very, very nice job. Hey, Richard, are you there? I am. I'm just curious, does, is your screen keep freezing on the PowerPoint? No, actually, that's actually working really well. No, it's mine just started moving, but a lot of times it sits there for three or four minutes without changing picture. Hmm. No, it's uh, it was seemed to be working OK for like from my view. Oh, OK, I'm just curious because I'm and that now it's working, of course, now that I asked you, but but it froze there for about two minutes again, and I went, well, that's odd. All right, I just I just saw that you were there and thought I'd ask. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, we're going to get started in another couple of minutes, so just hang tight. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with our second speaker for today. Um, so Josh um, already kind of interjected earlier, and he's been, well, if you were at the workshop yesterday, um, Josh led our roundtable, which went very well. Um, so Josh is a senior associate and project manager with Brandon Caldwell out of Tennessee. And we are very happy to have him today um, discussing why regulate, why do we regulate non SAUs? So um, you can go now, Josh. Um, we're excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Jesse. Hang on just one second. Let me find, find my other where my screen where. All right, there we go. So thanks again, everyone, for participating again in, in the second day of this. It's been a really tremendous turnout. I'm, I'm really impressed. I, I do a lot of, uh, I give a lot of presentations uh, across the country related to pretreatment, and this one has a, a, a really strong attendance and, and impressive turnout, um, especially for non-Arizona pretreatment programs. I, I've seen people from the East Coast, seen people from the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, uh, so, so it's pretty cool to see, um, you know, other other municipalities joining in uh, that aren't necessarily from Arizona. So thanks everyone for for attending. Hopefully you get a little bit of uh, you get something out of this presentation. Um, just to give you a little background, and I, you may or may not know this, but I formerly managed the City of Memphis's pretreatment program. So. Uh, some of the examples that I that I'm going to give today are are strictly based on my former pretreatment management experience and some of the issues that we ran into uh, while I was at Memphis and uh, some of the reasons why we chose to regulate um, facilities that maybe didn't quite hit those triggers of, of an SIU. So maybe they're not categorical. Maybe they uh, don't discharge. Maybe they don't discharge 25,000 gallons per day. Um, but they do have some potential to cause some some problems, some headaches, uh, or or maybe it's just you know they discharge relatively high concentrations of of organic loading, and and you just need to recoup some of those treatment costs that are incurred. So we'll go over um, just kind of in general, so an overview of pretreatment standards. Uh, we'll we'll jump into some you know, why we regulate these facilities and give you some examples. And then and then at the end, um, I kind of want this to be a little interactive uh, and, and feel free at any point in time to in the chat box, ask questions, use the raise hand function, or it's not going to hurt my feelings if you just interrupt me and, and, and jump in and ask a question, feel free. This, this is pretty informal. So um, at the end, 
I have two examples that I kind of like to go through. They're, they're somewhat of a case study, I guess. And, um, and, and then I want to ask kind of the audience how, you know, if they were in this, in, in this particular scenario, how would you regulate this facility? So uh, let's, let's get started. So, you know, I feel like just in general, to, to be fair, if we're going to talk about non-SIUs, we should at least, for, for those of you who may be relatively new to pretreatment, just kind of recap what is a significant industrial user. And so you'll hear, you'll hear, hear me throughout the presentation refer to them probably as SIUs, but when I say SIUs, I, I, I'm, I'm just using that as an acronym for significant industrial user. So a significant industrial user is any industrial user that hits any of these um, five um, caveats, let's call it. So they're a categorical industrial user, meaning that they have uh, processes in place that EPA has determined, generally speaking, are um, generate wastewaters that are problematic to either a receiving stream or to a, a POTW. And so they've identified uh, approximately 40 or 50 of those different industrial types um, a, a, as categorical and therefore have developed effluent, uh, effluent guidelines or pretreatment standards for those facilities. And you can find those, uh, I think they start at 40 CFR part 405 and go through part 471. Uh, so those are your metal finishers, your metal platers, your uh, transportation equipment cleaning, your, um, you know, uh, pesticide manufacturing and formulating type facilities. Then, and this is probably the, the most common, um, any facility that discharges uh, 25,000 gallons per day of processed wastewater or more on average. Um, and I would say that by far, in my experience, the vast majority of SIUs are an SIU because of that right there. Um, and, and then this one's a little, you don't see this one near as much. Um, the, the, so 5% or more of the hydraulic flow, hydraulic capacity or organic capacity of the receiving wastewater treatment facility or water reclamation facility, whatever type of facility you operate. And so um, occasionally you'll see this at, at smaller municipalities uh, that, that have smaller treatment systems, but you know, just if you operate a, a hundred million gallon per day uh, wastewater treatment plant, um, there's just not a lot of five million gallon per day dischargers out there. So um, I don't see this one triggering SIU near as much. I, I have run across it a few times, um, but but definitely not um, not a, it's not as it's not as common as let's say categorical industrial user or the uh, twenty five thousand gallon per day. Um, um, 25,000 gallon per day uh, criteria. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then uh, th these last two are, are a little bit um, a little bit more unique than the others. Um, so reasonable potential to adv adversely affect the POTW. So this one's really kind of in the eyes of, of the pretreatment program or the control authority, does it appear that there's reasonable potential for a facility to adversely affect your collection system, adversely affect your wastewater treatment plant, adversely affect uh, biosolids uh, for treatment facility, um, or even their end uses? And so um, definitely run across some facilities that, that, that fall into this category quite a bit. Um, and a lot of times, this is this is the the criteria that gets used for moving what we traditionally would would regulate as a non SIU into an SIU category. So let's say that they're not twenty five thousand gallons per day or five percent the hydraulic organic loading, or and they're not a, a categorical industry, but we've been regulating them. Let's say for the last couple of years, and they're just you know they're problematic. They're continuing to violate. They're continuing to upset the treatment facility. And so for this reason alone, we bump them up to kind of a higher priority category and regulate them as an SIU. 
Um, and then the final one being reasonable potential for violating pretreatment standards. Um, so, so if if there are none of these criteria, but they violate your local limits, let's say, or they violate your prohibited discharge standards, um, then for that reason alone, you can you can uh, classify them as a significant industrial user. So, so then we talk about SIUs and, and what's required of SIUs. And we talked about this maybe a little bit earlier when we were talking about dental facilities and if you're required to sample or inspect them. So I'm just strictly speaking from the federal perspective, the federal regulations. I, I'm not digging into any state specific requirements per se, um, because those vary from state to state. They also vary within the states. Um, they, they, they vary from MPDS permit to MPDS permit. So I can tell you that I've seen in the same state different pretreatment programs having different monitoring requirements detailed in their MPDS permit um, for, for various reasons. So I've even seen a program that in their MPDS permit was required to monitor, uh, to sample and inspect all SIUs quarterly, um, you know, four times a year, which is, you know, four times more stringent, let's call it, than, uh, or four times more frequent than uh, what the federal regulations say. But there's, a, there's, there's justification and reasoning for that. Um, so, so strictly speaking from the federal perspective, uh, the minimal monitoring requirements for um, the control authority or the pretreatment program is compliance sampling once per year and then compl a compliance inspection once per year. Um, and then the industrial user at a minimum has to perform a self-monitoring event twice per year as well. Now there are some uh, some caveats to that. If the if the control authority performs sampling in lieu of the industrial user, then then there's some differences in the amount of, of sampling that's required. Just off the top of my head, and please don't quote me on this, but I think that so if a, if an industrial user has to sample twice per year, and the control authority has to sample once per year, that would be three total samples in, in, in the year. But if the, in, if the control authority is doing it in lieu of the industrial user, they're actually only required to do it twice per year. Um, but once again, that, that's just, that's just uh, my recollection. Please, please don't hold me to that, but I believe that's correct. Uh, and, and so then, you know, that, so that's the minimum requirement. I would say that for the most part, um, all the pretreatment programs that I that I've worked with, that I, I've I've been to and audited, let's say on behalf of EPA or uh, various states that I've worked for in the past, I, I would say that nine times out of ten, they have some industrial users, maybe all of their industrial users, but they have some number of industrial users that they require to, um, to that that they oversee more frequently than that. So they go to these problem children, let's call them. Um, and perform sampling and perform inspections much more frequently than once per year. And probably even more common than that is that they require those facilities to um, perform self-monitoring much much more frequently. Um, and, and a good example of that is just surcharge monitoring. So let's say for organic loading, but whether it's BOD, whether it's COD or TSS, um, maybe even I've seen oil and grease, I've seen um, phosphorus, nitrogen um, as surcharge parameters. Um, and so if you're being billed based on the amount of organic loading that you're discharging to the treatment plant, then you're obviously going to want to have more than a couple sample events in a year. Um, and, and so generally speaking, these increase to monitoring frequencies, inspection frequencies, just the increase the general oversight is strictly determined based on their reasonable potential to adversely affect the uh, the treatment facility uh, or the collection system. <coughs> and so here, here's just some examples of why we increase these requirements. Um, so this is an example at a, so this is a, a large wastewater treatment plant uh, this is actually one of the treatment plants in Memphis. Um, it's a, 
about on average they're probably getting about 75 85 million gallons a day of wastewater um and probably i'm guessing probably about 15 to 20 million gallons of that is industrial waste um and so this particular treatment plant is it's very heavily loaded with with industrial waste um they're influent VOD concentration is is generally at at or around or may, even over a thousand milligrams per liter, um, and and so in this particular case, and you can see this is their aeration basins in the um, bi you know, biological secondary treatment process, um, which somewhat acts like a, a, a jacuzzi hot tub, let's call it. Okay, and they had a soap manufacturer that discharged to the facility that had some issues one day. And if you've ever poured, uh, let's say, like bubble bath into your hot tub, into your jacuzzi tub, and turn the jets on, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And so this, this is just some of the. Uh, this happened multiple times, unfortunately, over the last uh, several years. Um, uh, and so this is just one of the events that I was able to capture uh, on camera one day when I was actually at the at the treatment plant. And uh, it was this is not as bad as I've seen it. Uh, I've seen the foam, you know, up spill out over the um, the the handrails there. I've even seen it all the way up to the uh, to the stairs uh, and and up and over that walkway. So you know it, it's very problematic um, from a from a treatment plant perspective, uh, especially if you can't get rid of the foam um, and it actually goes out into the receiving stream, so then that, so then, you know, you have a lot, a lot, a lot more concern there with um, with with foam now leaving and going and, and floating down. In, in their case, it was the it's the Mississippi River, um, but just in general, any receiving stream, you would you would not want to see this in your effluent, um, and so ultimately we were able to. Take, enfor take enforcement action with on the industry, right? But let's just call it work with the industry um, to, to get into compliance, ultimately required them to put in a defomer system uh, to, to, to treat their wastewater with defomer um, before they even discharge it into the sewer. Uh, and, and I don't have any pictures of this, unfortunately, but I, I can tell you that multiple times in my career with just this one facility, I was called out to various manholes um, where where foam would just be billowing out. Uh, you know, it's blown the manhole lid off and, and foam's just billowing out. And, um, it, you know, as soon as we saw it, we, we knew immediately who, um, who, who the culprit was. And uh, it, it was pretty easy to track back because there's, um, you know, traces the foam all the way back to the facility. So uh, I would say that if in the event that you're trying to identify industrial sources of foam, that's much easier uh, backtracking through the collection system than it is, let's say, uh, something like oil and grease or, or BOD or just some other toxic pollutant because it's obviously visible, right? It floats on top, it, it intensifies as turbulence uh, increases. So um, it's pretty easy to, to, to identify those sources. But I, I will say, you know, the, the key to this is that um, this was a non-SIU. They didn't hit any of those triggers, but because of this alone, they had, they had a lot of problems with causing some upsets and, and interference uh, or pass through rather at the treatment plant because this foam would pass through um and go and go into the receiving stream and so ultimately we bumped this facility up from a non-siu permit to an siu permit just because they were causing uh, you know they were violating general prohibitions of in the federal regulation and, and so ultimately increased their permit their monitoring requirements things like that and just general oversight of the facility increased by our team as well Excuse me. So this is a, a biodiesel facility that that I that we that I used to regulate, and um, these are oil and grease uh, samples. Um, 
and so if you've ever collected an oil and grease sample, um, you know, you, you can see it, it, it's usually pre-preserved with, uh, um, you know, with, with an acid to, to, to help keep the sample uh, preserved. And, and so usually what you'll see, you know, pretty quick is, is that um, stratification of, uh, of the oil and, and it'll float to the top and, and, you know, the water be below. But I've never seen, except for this, I have never seen in my entire life uh, or career in doing this, I've never seen quite this level of oil uh, from a facility. Um, and so ultimately what happened was uh, this facility had so they say they had some pipes that were were crossed apparently and not um, they were pumping this uh, material they thought to a tank which was actually not going to a tank it was going through another pipe that that discharged through their stormwater outfall and so what wound up happening is and this is really just truly coincidental a public works director was playing golf at a golf course one saturday d just around the corner from this facility and uh in this this tributary uh stormwater tributary that this particular facility stormwater flowed through actually flowed through the center of this golf course and he sees this oily material flowing through that stream and obviously you know as a public works director knew that this was not this was not um, correct, you know, it shouldn't be happening. And um, they actually were able to, they we called in several people to do some investigation and backtracked it to the particular facility. And uh, we immediately, you know, started taking, collecting samples. There were a lot of issues at this facility when I went, um, and I, I didn't include any of these pictures, but they had just some terrible, massive amounts of oil spilled all around the facility. They had, they had hay bales um, all around their perimeter fence, trying to to block the oil from allowing it to to get out, and, which wasn't working. Obviously, um, they they had uh, just 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 terrible housekeeping, um, and so they they ultimately were able to to reroute all their piping and get it corrected. And so, like probably within um it was probably like two or three months later we started having these sewer overflows just downstream of this facility um and, and so after doing a little investigation we figure out that now the collection system the sewer collection system is clogged up with all of this grease uh and, and oil material and so backtracked it again obviously to the same facility and um you know, we, we did some investigation, figured out that once again, they were you know, better this time that they were not discharging it directly to a stormwater receiving stream, but they were still discharging it to a, uh, to the sanitary sewer. And we, the sample, these samples we collected over a course of a couple of days uh, were in excess of 30,000 milligrams per liter of oil and grease. And which was, you know, well over the city's limit of hundred milligrams per liter. So, uh, we took we took enforcement action, you know, obviously for that um, uh, bypassing treatment. I mean, we we hit them with everything that we could, um, but we had to also clean the collection system. You know, I mentioned we were having sewer overflows because of this, and so we had. It actually took our uh, collection systems crew about five weeks to get this segment of sewer uh, completely cleaned. Um, and and cost over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars actually um, in in additional manpower equipment um, overtime various things and 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 so um, we ultimately took enforcement action issued a civil penalty and included the cost of cleaning the collection system um, uh, in, in their penalty and and ultimately the facility you know drastically improved obviously when you when you hit a facility with two hundred thousand dollar plus um, penalty, they're going to take it a little more serious, um, and and so they were able to actually install better a better treatment system. Um, and you know, not to say that there haven't been some problems, but definitely tremendously better today 
than they were, let's say, uh, you know, when the, when these events were occurring. And this was a non-SIU. Um, ultimately got bumped up to an SIU um, because of their clear, blatant violations of pretreatment standards. Um, and I think now they're probably an SIU just because of their uh, volumetric um, discharges as well. But, um, you know, definitely a, a type of a facility that I would strongly recommend you paying a little bit closer attention to um, just because they have a really high potential to discharge high concentrations of oil and grease that could then solidify um, in the collection system. Yeah, so there's a just going through the chat. Uh, how do you go about figuring out the cost of collection system cleanup versus what would be normal? Well, so um, and and so this was probably about five, six years ago. So so my memory may be off a little bit, but um, what we did was we did not charge them. So our crews performed the vast majority. The city crews performed the vast majority of the um of the cleanup but we were working around the clock doing this and and so um because it was our own city crew we didn't charge them their you know the standard you know eight hours worth of, uh, of a work day we only charged them the overtime that the city incurred because in general uh, that person's going to be is a city employee full-time city employee and is going to get paid their salary, whether they're cleaning the collection system because of a of an industrial discharge, or if they're you know just doing their routine preventative maintenance throughout the collection system, and so uh, for for our purposes, we just calculated the cost of um, we actually had to buy some additional equipment, some different jetter nozzles and things um, to 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 help. Uh, break this stuff up because it solidified and just got super hard um, and, and ultimately they weren't able to able to catch it all on the downstream side and so a lot of it wound up going to the wastewater treatment plant and and so the primary clarifiers captured it um, and, and pulled it out and, and and their scum box that catches all the floatables um, usually has to be pumped out about once a month and, and they had to daily, they were pumping that scum box out. So we charged them for the cost of, of that pumping service as well. Um, so, so we just calculated the costs that were abnormal to our operations. Um, the overtime, the additional equipment required, um, they, they actually had to use some chemicals uh, to help break it up. Um, you know, the, the additional cost of, of cleaning the scum box. Uh, from the primary clarifiers, but then we also went through our enforcement response plan um, to determine which violations actually occurred, which there were several, um, and then associated um, civil penalties as well as just kind of the cost associated with the cleanup. So, so, so the the ultimate penalty was a civil penalty for multiple violations, and then the cost uh, of cleaning cleaning the collection system. So almost like a damages assessment, although I wouldn't necessarily call it damage to the collection system. Um, it just, it just, you know, clogged it up and, and just had to be cleaned, but, but some, it would fall kind of in line with damages, I guess. Yeah. So uh, that's a good point that, that some, that some municipalities, you know, issue contracts, for cleaning the collection system. And, and, and a lot of times those contracts are based on um, just the, the, the size of the, the diameter of the pipe, um, kind of on a per foot, that linear foot basis. Uh, and so that could have been used as well. Um, Excuse me. So uh, I, if any of you participated yesterday, you, you may have seen this, um, this graph that I, that I showed uh, when we talked about craft breweries. So um, this is this is real pH data from a brewery uh, that I that I worked with several years ago. Um, and this was their uh, raw pH without any neutralization going straight into the 
into the collection system. And so I show you this because I think craft breweries, as we mentioned earlier, as we mentioned yesterday, are, are very prevalent now in, in pretty much all communities and um, are, 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 are regarded very well, very highly amongst the citizens of those communities. However, they, you know, we don't want to run them off, but from a regulatory perspective, we have to have, we need to have some level of oversight of these facilities um, because they can cause damage to your collection system and they can increase the cost uh, of, of treatment at the wastewater treatment facility. And we'll talk about that one a little bit more later. Um, but, but just looking at their raw wastewater, uh, and this was just a, a, a one, you know, a 24 hour period that we measured uh, continuously their, their pH. And you can see that, you know, I, I would venture to guess that most municipalities here, this would definitely violate uh, your, your permit limits or your local limits for pH. Um, and, and so we, we saw discharges as low as almost three. Uh, and then discharges as high as almost 12. So um, they definitely have a, a high uh, probability of, of, of having some corrosive wastewaters, especially if they don't have uh, a neutralization system, at a minimum an equalization system to, to try and maybe equalize and normalize the, the flows and discharges coming from the facility. And, and as I mentioned yesterday, you you see that um, you, you see these big swings, wide swings in pH uh, for a couple different reasons. One, the the product that they're manufacturing, the beer, generally speaking, is relatively acidic, um, and, and this would apply to any any uh, beverage facility for the most part. Um, they're going to use um, cleaning systems, so clean in place is, is usually the terminology that they use or CIP cleaning systems where they are going to use a, a caustic, they're going to rinse and then they're going to use a caustic cleaner followed by an acidic um, sanitizer. And, and so those pHs are going to vary, you know, minute by minute, depending on what cycle of the CIP cleaning uh, that, that they're on. And so there are some systems out there where they can recycle some of the uh, some of the recycle, some of the uh, cleaning solutions. So not as much of it's going to the uh, sewer. And that definitely helps. But uh, there's still kind of that first pass of, of rinse water, the first pass of, of caustic and the first pass of the acidic um, sanitizer is still most of the time going to the sewer. And so you're still going to see some pretty wide pH swings. There just may not be as much volume of each one of those, um, but but I would I would strongly recommend, with respect to breweries uh, and craft breweries in particular, because I, I've seen a lot of craft breweries that ha that do not have any wastewater treatment infrastructure, any pretreatment systems whatsoever. They they just it, it runs out onto a floor drain into a trench, and then it just goes into um, you know a, a pipe that that goes to, directly into the sewer. Um, so, so I would, uh, you know, caution you to be aware uh, of these types of facilities um, and, and consider some type, some, some minimum level of control over these facilities because their pH can definitely be corrosive to your collection system. And so now this is, uh, this is actually a, a screenshot of a dashboard that we have in Memphis at, at a brewery. Um, and I've, I've grayed out or, or just kind of made the facilities anonymous just so you don't necessarily know which facilities they are, but uh, at the request of the city of Memphis. But uh, I mentioned yesterday, Memphis has um, their own pH monitoring infrastructure at 10 of their largest industrial users. One of them is a brewery, and um, this was just a screenshot that I captured. I think it was uh, maybe about uh, a week's worth. It was, I think it was last week's data, maybe, uh, that I just pulled a screenshot of uh, off the dashboard just to show you um, this particular industrial user has a pH neutralization system, um, and they. But you can see. Somewhere around February 15th, February 16th, 
uh, you can see that they um, they had a pretty uh, you know a pretty big swing to, to on the low end for pH for about an entire day, um, and, and then it comes back up. Uh, but but their pH for for about the entire day ranged uh, from about three to about five and a half, kind of bouncing up and down, up and down all day. Um, so so you can see that um, you know pH is definitely a big concern from breweries, e even with this. And and if I were to have stretched it, if I were to uh, drill down maybe to a smaller date range, you could really see you know just the up and down, up and down. Uh, of the uh, trend line, uh, but I, I think you can still kind of see it here that it's just all day, every day, it's just up and down, up and down, up and down, because they're continuously um, processing batches. So they're they're continuously filling bottles or cans or kegs, um, and so there's always going to be product loss through that transferring of uh, uh, of beer into the bottle uh, or into the can. Uh, which is going to be acidic, and then they're after they finish a particular beer, they're going to do a changeover to a different flavor or a different type of beer, um, and so they have to flush CIP clean, um, and so just continuously all day, every day, it's it, their pH is up and down, up and down, up and down. And if they don't have a large enough uh, neutralization system, uh, that, then then they're going to really, really struggle with being compliant with pH. <clears throat> so this is a uh, facility that that I inspected once, and this was um, uh, this is a trench drain. You can see uh, this this actually was a pa is a paper mill, and uh, they, they make bullet paper and tissue paper, and and they um, had this tote of. Uh, uh, I believe it was sodium hydroxide, if I remember correctly. You can see kind of the the white um, kind of cakey, dusty material that you you commonly will see with with sodium hydroxide as it as it um, leak it leaks out. So ultimately, what was happening was this this tote was sitting here for a very specific reason. It was leaking, um, and they didn't want to get rid of it because it had product in it that they wanted to use. So they just stored it over a trench drain that went directly to the sewer. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, this particular facility is obviously, uh, it's a categorical facility. They were obviously an SIU, but this particular scenario could happen at any non-SIU non type facility. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the, the purpose of this is to kind of show that you know, even if they have low volumes that they discharge, even if they have low uh, organic loadings, they could have, you know, poor cleanliness, poor housekeeping. Um, they could do things that they may not know could be harmful to the collection system or to the treatment plant, such as allowing a tote of sodium hydroxide to just drip directly into the sewer. Um, so, um, I say all that to say that that you know I do think that it's important to periodically do some walkthroughs of these non-SIU facilities because you will you will routinely find random things like this, uh, and it's just an educational opportunity. It's your it's your chance to let them know, hey, look, first off, you can't store material like this, uh, and here's why. And and nine times out of ten. They're just unaware, um, you, you know, maybe maybe it's not quite nine times out of 10, maybe it's probably like five times out of 10, but they're gonna act like they're unaware nine times out of 10. Um, so, so definitely because of these types of scenarios, it's it's worth going out and performing just some, some brief walkthroughs of the facility. Maybe they're not full inspections like you would, um, like you would do for an SIU, um, but you know you're laying you're laying eyes on process operations. You're laying eyes on any um, on any treatment facility that they may have. You're especially looking at their housekeeping, their chemical storage, um, things like that. So I'm gonna go over to the chat. Looks like there's been a lot of uh, a lot of chat since since I've been talking. Let me just read through these real quick. 
Wow. Yeah. Lawn care pesticide company that does that. That would be that would be really, really bad situation. Um, I, I would venture to say that, that those would be pretty high concentrations of, of herbicides, pesticides, uh, just draining straight into into the sewer. That would that could really, really cause some problems at the treatment plant. So yeah, so Diana, uh, and it looks like Chelsea Chelsea kind of hit on that. You definitely can consider a microbrewery uh, an SIU, and I'm not saying maybe maybe I should back up a minute. I'm not trying to tell you to not consider them just by default an SIU. I think that it's a, in my opinion, it's very much a case by case scenario. Um, it depends on. The size of your treatment plant. If if you're and and I come from you know 200 million gallon per day wastewater treatment plant. So a, a microbrewery that's discharging 5,000 gallons every other day is going to have minimal to let's say no impact on the wastewater treatment plant itself. But any any size brewery could have negative and detrimental impacts to the collection system, um, especially right at their um, outfall where they tie into the collection system. So um, it, it, it's, it's very much case by case. I, I would say I see uh, when, when, I was, when I was working with EPA doing pretreatment audits, we went to, I, I've probably been to, I don't know, 30 or 40 uh, breweries of all shapes and sizes, and I would say it's probably like 50-50 the number of the, that uh, of the facilities that I've physically been to uh, that the local pretreatment program kind of by default classifies them as an SIU and not a non-SIU. Um, and then I would say of the other 50 percent, probably half of them permit them as some type of a non-SIU BMP style of permit, and then the other half generally just do not um, permit them at all. But but maybe periodically checks on them, um, you know, with an inspection or with a uh, industrial user survey uh, periodically. Uh, but you definitely can't. There's no reason why you can't say that they're an SIU, especially if they have reasonable potential to adversely affect the treatment plant reasonable potential to um, uh, to violate a pretreatment standard. Um, so so definitely you would be well within your your legal authority to classify them as an SIU. Uh, are the are they surprise inspections slash walkthroughs? Uh, so I guess you're referring to just in general, if we were to go and do um, walkthroughs or inspections of non-SIUs, would we schedule these or not? Um, so I generally always try by default to do, you know, what you're called, referring to as a surprise, a, a non-scheduled um, inspection for most facilities. However, there's always, there's always um, issues that can arise from that. There are definitely uh, situations, um, you know, and, and maybe the first time you go out to the facility, maybe that's not the right time to do a surprise inspection, let's call it. Maybe that should be a little bit more scheduled, a little bit more formal, um, just to educate these non-SIUs of, of who you are, why you're coming to their facility, why you want to walk through. Um, in a lot of cases, there may be some you know, proprietary confidential type information that they may not want you to see. So just showing up and popping in may present some some issues from from maybe their their legal side. Um, I, I can I can say that even with an EPA badge, I've shown up at, at facilities uh, and, and they have tried to deny access just due to proprietary confidential business information that they didn't want me to see. Um, so I, I think that that's even 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 more heightened with you just showing up, right? It, it just it kind of raises the hair on the back of their neck, so to speak. So um, 
you know, I, I think that you should, you can do it, you know, scheduled or, or, or unscheduled, but I think that you need to kind of make that determination of, you know, maybe what's best for the specific scenario. A lot of times you show up um, un, at an unscheduled inspection and it's just, you know, they're caught off guard and they think you're there to shut them down. And so there's just kind of um, uh, a power struggle from the beginning. And that's not the intent of these inspections. The intent of these inspections is to just become more familiar with the facility, understand what they're doing. Yeah, they may be doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, uh, and, and maybe they need to be shut down. I'm not going to say that you're never going to run across a scenario, but, uh, but you know, uh, we're not going there with that in mind. Like, that's what we're going to do at this facility. So, um, you know, I think it, you, you should just use kind of your best judgment on if, if these should be uh, scheduled or unscheduled. Let's see what else we have. We've had great success with microbreweries and not being rather than Yeah, so these are all good comments. Um, keep them coming. Uh, I, I really want this to be uh, as interactive as possible. So um, feel free to uh, ask questions. Just um, uh, make make comments, uh, detail kind of your experiences with, with similar issues or similar scenarios. Oops, sorry. Uh, so uh, another kind of, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, I think in the round table maybe, uh, so, some industry, uh, and maybe it was before the round table, I can't remember, but I know we talked about it yesterday. We talked about um medical medical facilities i know we talked a lot about hospitals uh talked some about nursing home facilities uh and so this is a downstream manhole of a nursing home that i uh i i was at the time working for the uh, municipality as a consultant trying to help them get a better handle on uh the the rags the wipes the gloves the the bed pads uh you name it that, that it was all being just flushed down the toilet uh, or down the drain. It, and it's, it was truly, truly amazing uh, the things that they were able to successfully get into the sewer uh, downstream of this facility. And so um, all of this went to a pump station. Um, and so I think we've all, you know, heard horror stories of, uh, you know, the, the, the issues with flushable wipes that, and that they cause in the collection system, in the, in the pump stations, in the bar screens at the treatment facilities. I've seen, you know, I've seen a Dr. Oz video uh, that I think NACWA uh, actually helped, um, helped participate in. I've seen, uh, I, I believe, and maybe this was the Dr. Oz video, but it was uh, New York City's wastewater treatment plant that influent bar screens, and they took a rake and just showed how they have to, you know, rake off the uh, flushable wipes uh, from the bar screens, just you know, in just tremendous amounts of volume, uh, just truly unbelievable. And then when these things um, ever come across, and they're going to in the collection system, when they ever get introduced to fat soils and grease, along with rags. I mean, it, it's just like concrete. It just sets up and, uh, and is really difficult to, uh, to get out of there. It causes a lot of problems. And so this is another type of a facility that may not be a traditional significant industrial user, but definitely due to just kind of history uh, from, from a lot of municipalities across the country, they've had a lot of problems. And some of you here, you know, may have had very similar experiences but this was you can see the down the picture on the right is just a shot down into the manhole <coughs> excuse me it's a, a picture of the manhole and you can see all the wipes floating um in the manhole i mean it's just tremendous volume and they uh they just took a uh, you know very non-technical uh they took a fishing net uh and extended the handle and uh, and dipped it down in there and just kept on pulling rags and 
and and bed pads and gloves and all kinds of, of various materials out out of the sewer and dumped them just into this bucket just for a perspective of of the volume but uh i mean it was it was a tremendous tremendous amount and then that goes downstream to the pump station and this is what actually started the the investigation the downstream pump station um was uh, it it had a system in place when the impeller you know started struggling to to operate to spin that it would you know as a safety precaution would shut down the pump station and when it did that it would notify the municipality that the pump station was down uh, through their SCADA system. Uh, and, and so this was happening more and more and more, becoming more routine. Um, and I mean, on a, on a weekly basis, they were having to call crews in at all hours of the night, all throughout the day, like three or four times a week to, to go and clean this, uh, this pump station because it, it had shut down. And every time they would go, it would have all these rags, all of these wipes, um, you know, all these various materials that had, that had gotten, uh, you know, stuck and wrapped around the, the shaft of the impeller to the point that it could, could no longer spin. And so we, they started doing some, some, you know, back tracing of the collection system and identified the sources of, um, of the uh, nurse. It's actually... Uh, four different nursing homes, actually, uh, with one of them being much worse than the rest of them. Uh, and so what we ultimately did, um, we sent them all letters um, and required them to to uh, attend a mandatory meeting, um, where, which would have ultimately kind of been, a, you know, you might could have called it a show calls hearing. Um, but but really what we did, we had a PowerPoint presentation ready with all these pictures. We showed them all of the issues that they were causing. We went over kind of the financials of it, uh, you know, how much cost the city was incurring due to having to go out and perform uh, maintenance of, uh, on the pump station on a, on a, you know, almost daily basis. Um, and and ultimately that we were going to start charging them for all of this on top of civil penalties um, for, for violating federal um, pretreatment standards. Uh, and, and so we looked through their ordinance. The ordinance gave the ordinance and it had enough flexibility that we could consider these facilities non-domestic users. Um, and then because they were considered a non-domestic user, then we could apply the rules and regulations within the ordinance um, to those facilities. And so, um, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the presentation about, you know, ensuring that your local ordinance um, ha has some, if, if you're wanting to regulate these facilities, it has some flexibility and, and doesn't just detail, let's say significant industrial user, but gives you the flexibility to also regulate with the ordinance um, other non-domestic users. And so then this this goes back to just any any non-SIU. It doesn't matter what type of a facility they are, but if they if they have the ability uh, to discharge high concentrations, uh, whether it's BOD, oil and grease, um, phosphorus, COD, that that would exceed your surcharge thresholds, then you then you know to be fair and equitable, even if even if their volumes, their discharge volumes are not extremely high, um, to be fair and equitable, those facilities should pay their fair share uh, of the cost of treatment. Um, because if they're not paying it, then it's in, in most municipalities, it's you're still paying the utility bill to operate the treatment facility. So it's just coming out of the general sewer fund. Um, which is, you know, paid for by all users. So all of the users are paying for the additional treatment cost of this, let's say, one facility or three facilities. So whether they're, you know, and we talked about some of these facilities yesterday, whether they're microbreweries, craft breweries, whether they're bakeries, um, whether they're maybe even food service establishments, they discharge higher concentrations of BOD, of oil and grease, of TSS than domestic concentrations would be. And so they should pay uh, a slightly higher um, 
sewer rate because it costs more to treat their wastewater. So just be aware that that's maybe one reason why you may increase the requirements of a non-traditional SIU and require them to maybe sample more frequently so you can really determine what that sewer fee needs to be, um, uh, what those surcharge rates need to be. And, and so maybe with that, just real quick, before we go to the next slide, and, and as I'm talking on the next slide, how about just in the chat box, let me know it, of all the people that are here today, how many of you have what you would consider a non-SIU that you have some level of oversight? So you have, a, maybe you permit them, maybe you don't, but you do inspection or you do you know, periodic um, surveys to understand what it is uh, that they have. I'm just curious uh, how many of you uh, experience this in your own pretreatment program uh, and, and how many of these in general, you know, a rough, a rough estimate of how many facilities that you would regulate in this way. And then we'll total that up uh, a little later in the, in the presentation. So uh, then here, here's just another example. And this is a case study uh, of a, um, uh, a paper mill, which again, paper mill, most of the time is a categorical industrial user. So uh, they're, they are an SIU, but the, the issues that are occurring in this particular um, scenario could easily have been at a facility uh, that was not an SIU. So uh, I, I wanna kind of use it as a case study uh, anyways, even though it, it did come from an SIU because I think it's relevant to the topic. Um, so, so this was a, a paper mill that was an existing paper mill uh, in this in this municipality, and um, they decided to add a new paper machine to uh, the mill. And so uh, it was a, a top of the line, you know, like three hundred fifty million dollar capital investment that that they you know uh, decided was going to be worth their time, worth their money. And so they they pulled the trigger. They bought the they bought the the paper machine, it's actually uh, amazing. This, so this was in Memphis. They shipped it like literally on a ship all the way across the ocean, came up you know, into the Gulf of Mexico, up the Mississippi River on a barge, and then they docked the barge um, like about a half mile from this facility just on the banks of the Mississippi River, and then trucked all the different components of this uh, um, paper machine um, about a half mile to uh, to the facility. It, it was unreal. It was it was amazing to, to actually watch it. But um, so so they got it constructed, um, you know, and, and the way it kind of works. And I, I was not familiar with this as much is that the paper machine is constructed and built, and then they build the building around it uh, because it's such a massive piece of equipment. Um, you know, it, this one's about the size of a football field it, it's it's quite large and um so so they had the machine ready to operate but they hadn't finished all the little in, in, intricacies of the building itself of the monitoring system uh uh and so they didn't have their um sampling equipment hadn't, they hadn't received it yet um and so they decided to go ahead and start operating without having their their um, continuous monitoring, you know, their ISCO sampler or whatever it was that they were buying, the flow meter, they decided to go ahead and start operating. And <coughs> they had uh, a, a, they called it a chest, it's essentially a tank that they didn't realize was continuously overflowing paper fiber solids before it went to the paper machine and they was just going directly into the sewer. And um, those pulp paper fiber solids um, went to the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, this particular plant that had no pretreatment, no screening, no capabilities of removing any solids from their waste stream. They just paid surcharge fees and um, discharged all their TSS to the treatment plant. And so, 
uh, because of this just massive excess of TSS that was coming in that was abnormal to the treatment facility. They were over the course of about, it took about uh, two weeks, maybe a week. Um, they started seeing settable solids starting to increase, you know, increase, increase coming into the head of the plant. And then their clarifier blankets uh, in, in the secondary clarifiers you know, start to really getting fluffy, really getting tall. They're, they're pulling them down, but still they just keep rising and rising and rising with abnormal amounts uh, uh, of solid settling down. And, and it got so thick, the blankets and the clarifiers got so thick that, and these are pretty big, like hundred foot diameter clarifiers, um, you know, so with pretty, pretty large scraper arms, you know, continuously spinning around. Um, and the drives that, that drive those clarifiers um, could, could no longer um, manage um, and ultimately fail. they burned out. They burned the motors out. And uh, because of the sheer amount of solids that were in the secondary clarifiers. And this happened to three of the city's eight uh, secondary clarifiers. And, and, and so it drastically um, you know, it, it, it drastically caused, I mean, there's major, major issues like when one clarifier goes down, right? So now you've got almost 50% of your clarifiers that are not functioning all at the same time. And while you, while we have some spare parts on hand, you know, we don't have like three of these clarifier drives. So it took, it took several weeks to even get the equipment in. The city was operating at, you know, approximately 40% or so of the uh, clarifier, clarifying capabilities during this time um, and, and was really problematic. Ca ultimately caused, uh, I think we have some, yeah, so ultimately caused some uh, MPDS permit violations for the treatment plant. Uh, and here's some of the downstream uh, manhole pictures. I mean, it's just, it was just unreal uh, what this stuff looked like. Um, and just super thick, foamy, um, it, it's just really, really nasty stuff. Um, so the city ultimately took enforcement action for uh, several different things, repair costs of the clarifier drives. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't charge them. I, I felt like they should charge them for the full price. They didn't, um, they didn't charge the full price of the clarifier drives because the clarifier drives were like 35 years old. And um, so they only charged them for a prorated amount uh, of the of the of the new motors that they had to buy in the drives, but uh, they charged them about forty four thousand in repair costs. Uh, they were able to, to we were able to kind of quasi calculate the increase in suspended solids uh, that was experienced during that like two or three week period, uh, and charged them fifty two thousand dollars just in additional treatment charges for TSS. Uh, and then ninety thousand dollars in civil penalties. Uh, we in Memphis we had a, a maximum civil penalty of ten thousand dollars per day per violation, and we were able to, um, to to find five permit violations and five serious ordinance violations. Um, I, or sorry, five permit violations and four serious ordinance violations. So uh, we assessed the ninety thousand dollars in civil penalties. So. Uh, the total penalty was like $186,000 for this one uh, instance where their ISCO sampler didn't come in before they were ready to operate, so they decided to operate. Had they had their sampler, um, sampling equipment, you know, they would have, while it's, it still may have occurred for a couple of days, they would have got their TSS results back and they would have seen, man, our TSS results are, you know, astronomical. And they would have investigated. It wouldn't have occurred. You know, it wouldn't have happened. A uh, lot of a lot of stories. You know, a lot of lessons learned here. Another issue was that because of some other various issues going on at the city, we were down in our workforce at the time and didn't have we we didn't have enough inspectors to 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 get all of our work done. And and so as they were starting up we did not send a crew out to perform an inspection of, uh, of the facility during startup. Um, and, and so, you know, that one's maybe a little bit on the city um, and, and definitely a lesson that I learned because I got, I got chewed out um, 
you know, pretty bad for, for not sending a crew out there to, to perform inspections uh, during startup. So, um, you know, that's definitely a, a good idea uh, to, and, and reasons why you definitely need to have uh, so, some oversight on facilities during startup, even if they're maybe not in SIU, because they may, they may just not know what it is that they're discharging to the sewer. Let me look through the chat real quick. Um, so it looks like there's definitely some facility, some municipalities out there that are regulating some non-SIUs as a, a, a regulating non-SIU facilities. Um, looks like some breweries, uh, a lot of surcharging. It looks like additional treatment charges uh, for BOD, COD, TSS. Uh, let's see. We work with yeah, water treatment plant. So that's an interesting one. So I have a little experience there as well. Um, uh, this this comes from Kayla Moore, um, where we we actually did re traditionally didn't regulate the uh, drinking water plants um, as SIUs. We um, regulated them as a non-SIU. And then they started causing tons of issues with suspended solids um, and and flow rate issues. They would try and discharge massive amounts of water in like an hour and then start causing sewer overflow. So we we actually wound up started regulating them as SIUs because um, their their TSS concentrations were really, really high. Um, they were discharging quite a large volume of water as well. Um, and, and just over a very short period of time when they would, it, what they were discharging was their filter backwash water. So they would uh, backwash their uh, multimedia filters um, and get all of the solid particulates out. In, in, in this case, it was predominantly iron solids um, just due to the, the, the water source uh, had, had a high concentration of iron that they were removing. And then they would send that to an underground storage tank um, until it got full, and then they would just send it to the sewer. Um, and, and so we actually wound up surcharging them on TSS because their TSS concentrations were astronomical. Um, and then we put a flow rate restriction on them to prevent sewer overflows downstream of their facility. So definitely be aware of your drinking water plants. They have some opportunities let's call it to to, to, to cause some issues with uh, um, you know flow rates and and high solids uh, and, and maybe even their brine stream if they're having to use ro at all um, you know that brine waste stream can, can be pretty nasty as well let's see what else is in here yeah a lot of uh, a lot of surcharge comments granite cutters have also caused some issues yeah yeah so so the you know the the granite the tile um it's definitely it definitely has a lot of uh suspended solids that are that are pretty bad you know pretty nasty stuff uh that that's that could cause problems definitely in the collection system because it's going to settle super fast um, and, and it almost kind of like turns into the once it, if it ever can dry out, it, it really kind of turns into like a concrete almost. So um, definitely be aware of, you know, your granite cutting facilities, trying to figure out um, what they're doing. They should have, you know, a solid separator, essentially, that's capturing those granite, you know, cuttings um, before it goes into the sewer. Yeah, so solids interceptor, you know, definitely strongly recommended for, for granite facilities. Uh, let's see. And that's a great example of a BMP, right? So you're not necessarily going to hold them to a TSS standard, but you're going to require them to install and maintain a solid separator. Um, you know, so very similar to a FOG program um, it, it, it is how that would operate.
Uh, let's see. Do you count volume from chiller water, HVAC, and the 25,000 gallon? All right. So <laughs> <coughs> chiller water is kind of a weird thing. You know, so is like non-contact cooling water. Um, I go back and forth on it. So because a lot of times these facilities put chemicals into uh, the the chillers, the you know, into the non-contact cooling cooling water systems to prevent you know slime and algae from growing, um, and and so it can it can have things in it that you're not necessarily going to want them to discharge um, to the sewer per se at certain concentrations. So in general, most the pre-treatment regulations do. Uh, exclude non-contact cooling water from that 25,000 gallon per day um, criteria, but I think that's also assuming that it doesn't contain it's it doesn't contain pollutants, right? So so you know it, it it's pure water, right? It's it's basically drinking water quality. If it starts containing pollutants or contaminants that could potentially cause pass through could potentially cause interference or just issues in the collection system. Then at that point in time, I think that you could count uh, non-contact cooling water, uh, chiller water as, um, uh, you know, towards the 25,000 gallon per day. Aaron, did you have a question? Oh, there was a hand raised. My apologies, I was still on mute. <laughs> oh, you're good. All right, uh, we have several data centers here that their only process is cooling water. Um, yep. And when they get up into the flows well above the 25,000 gallons per day, um, we do permit them if they meet those requirements, uh, mainly because that's their process and the sheer volume that they're discharging, especially if they have uh, recycle rates. Um, that way they're concentrating the source water, then discharging. Um, therefore, that's why we do permit them as an SIU, because um, that concentrated source water can often lead to very high concentrations of selenium or TDS or any kind uh -huh. of resistance. Yeah, I was going to actually mention TDS, um, uh, electrical conductivity. I don't know if you all have um, electrical conductivity limits in your MPS permits there or not, but uh, this, you know, this chiller water can definitely have um, you know, some high concentrations of TDS, high concentration of EC. Um, data centers are kind of a new up and coming thing uh, that, that we're seeing more and more of now. Um, and, and so, you know, basically it's just a server farm inside of a huge building. Um, and, and those servers are operating and they, you know, they obviously get relatively warm. And so they have to cool that huge facility um, with, with, you know, massive amounts of chiller water. Um, and, and so they, they have to figure out a way to get rid of the chiller water. And so generally speaking, I think the easiest way to do it is to discharge it to the sewer. Um, and so I, I'm seeing a lot more of this with, with Google, with Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, all the kind of cloud companies nowadays, you are the, these um, server farms are popping up everywhere. And uh, yeah, you know, in that scenario, I, I think, it, and once again, it totally depends on the size of your wastewater treatment plant as well, right? So determining what reasonable potential uh, impact they could have at your treatment plant, uh, even if they're over 25,000 gallons per day, and I didn't put this in the definition, but even if they're over 25,000 gallons per day, if you can show that they don't have reasonable potential to adversely impact your treatment plant, then you don't actually have to permit them as an SIU. But I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, most people go ahead and permit them as SIUs. Um, but you know, you just have to you use common sense, use kind of your 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 own internal judgment and knowledge of, of your facility to know if if at these specific volumes are they going to have some reasonable potential to cause some problems. Um, at your treatment plant and make a determination of if you should permit them as an SIU or not. Thank you. Yep. Let's see. Copper TSS, turbidity. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's good. Uh, Travis, you talk about your drinking water plant, wastewater plant kind of being under the same ownership, let's call it. Uh, sometimes sometimes it's, it, it can be a political battle trying to regulate those those drinking water plants um, when they're not. But it sounds like you, you've got a good working relationship there. All right, so uh, I don't. So the question is, if an industry discharges twenty-five thousand gallons per day during one day in a month, do you consider uh, consider them an SIU, or do they need to average twenty-five thousand gallons per day? So the rule of thumb is based on production days. So if they are operating, so so it's not just how much how much volume of water are they generating in a month and let's divide it by the number of days in a month that's not how EPA looks at it EPA takes into consideration um, operation days so days that the facility is open is operating you know manufacturing or processing whatever it is that they process and generating wastewater so if they're doing that then that counts as a day Okay, and and so maybe they're a batch discharger, right? So they don't have to discharge it all in in one, it, you know, all they don't have to discharge every day. But let's say they discharge once a week, um, and they've operated. Uh, so so let's just say you know four times in a month, um, and, and they generated that wastewater from five days a week. So you would use the operational days of five days per week. Uh, times four weeks, so they operated 20 days, and whatever that total volume that they discharged, those four days would be divided by you know the number of the 20 days uh, that they actually operated in that month. So when you're trying to calculate 25,000 gallons per day, it's based on operational days, not just number of days um, in the month. So just be aware of that. That it's kind of a little bit of a nuance, but that's that's how that's how EPA looks at it. All right, so let's keep going then. Uh, Chelsea, what what do we have? About thirty more minutes, or is that about right? All right, we'll keep going. So, um, you know, so so when we've, we've talked about, um, you know, facilities that you should regulate if they're 25,000 gallons per day or not, uh, kind of how do we handle these non-SIUs? So, you know, what about the facilities that aren't 25,000 gallons per day? What about the industrial users, you know, that are greater than 25,000 gallons per day, but have no potential to impact uh, the collection system or the treatment plant, which is what I just referred to um, in the SIU definition that I didn't include on the first slide. You know, are they an SIU or are they not an SIU? And I think it's important for you all to know what is your specific, you know, wastewater or pretreatment ordinance? How does it define industrial user or non-domestic user? Does it just use the, the, the like significant industrial user? Does it is it more broad to say industrial user and define different types of facilities that could fall into that? Uh, or maybe it's, you know, overly broad and just refers to them as non-domestic users. So um, anything but but a residential source. So, so you need to, um, to, to kind of understand and be aware of what are the different types, uh, what your local ordinance specifies. Um, so you can know better know be better informed on how you what your legal authority is to regulate uh, these specific facilities. Thanks, Dave. I got that. <coughs> All right. So let's uh, let's look at just some different facilities that we've talked about over the last two days. Uh, these are just different types of facilities that, traditionally speaking, may be 
classified as non-SIU. So uh, let's just call it the craft beverage manufacturing uh, industry because it, it could be a craft brewery, it could be a craft distillery, it could be um, you know a non-alcoholic uh, beverage such as um, sodas, um, um, kombucha. Yeah, I see that. That that's a that's a, a newer one, uh, but but has similar wastewater characteristics. Um, it could be tea, um, you know, teas, ciders, um, wineries. You know, that just just all kinds of different. Pretty much any any food grade beverage that you're going to drink is going to have to go through you know relatively strict um, protocols for cleaning and, and sanitization. So um, what I think craft breweries, craft distilleries, craft wineries are probably more prevalent um, than, than the rest of them. Um, but but any of these types of facilities can are going to to discharge very similar uh, types of wastewater. Uh, so, so those are some that may, you know, that you may consider permitting as non-SIUs. Uh, bakeries are, are another one. Bakeries have uh, a lot of solids um, and, and they actually have a lot of uh, oil and grease a lot of times because they use a lot of, uh, you know, um, oil grease type materials to to keep their breads or, you know, baked goods, whatever they're making from sticking to uh, the pans or trays. Uh, they may also, you know, make like donuts or, you know, sugary type um, uh, baked goods uh, that, that could have some pretty substantial concentrations of, uh, of BOD or COD as well. So uh, just kind of be aware of that. Most of the bakeries that I've been to in my career are going to have an oil water separator slash solid separator. Um, so, so the oil is all going to kind of float to the top. The solids are all going to settle to the bottom. You know, basically, an oversized grease trap, like a big grease interceptor, um, is really all it is. So um, they're they're a lot a lot more kind of like a uh, um, food service establishment from that perspective. Yeah, and Christy just wrote in there that bakeries can have a real problem for pH. Uh, that that is very true as well. Um, pH is definitely um, a, a pollutant of concern from these facilities for, for various reasons, whether it's their cleaning operation, sanitization, uh, but also just the sugary um, components can, uh, the, the, the sugar contents can, can really drop the pH um, for, pretty tremendously. Yeah, solids for sure. Um, so, so another classification that we don't traditionally see Regulated as non-SIUs, but can definitely have some issues or, or can cause some problems are laundry mats and dry cleaners. So, so you know, we see from pretreatment programs perspective, kind of commercial slash industrial laundries, right? You know, the guys that have like a 5,000 pound um, clothes washing machine that, that can wash like, you know, the, the, the largest load of laundry that you've ever seen. Um, and then these big probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a laundromat, two things. If you've ever seen a tunnel dryer, it, it, it's just amazing how big that thing is um, and, and how much laundry that they can put through it. And, and the other thing that truly amazes me are the automatic like folding and ironing uh, machines it's, that, are, that do, they do a lot of um, uh, rags, towels, um, uh, bed sheets, things like that. But, but dry cleaners and laundry, especially laundry mats, solids are going to be an issue, right? Like, just think about your personal at your at your home. You know, you in in you open your dryer and you you pull out. You know, you've only washed like two loads of laundry, dried two loads of laundry, and you you pull out that little lint trap, and it's just cake solid full of lint. Uh, lint can really be problematic um, from a commercial industrial laundry perspective with solids, but also at, at a laundry mat, because a laundry mat, basically just a really highly concentrated, um, you know, uh, laundering location, right? So um, imagine if at your home, you had 25 dryers going all at the same time, imagine the amount of lint that you would, um, that you would see coming from there. So um, laundry mats are really no different. 
uh, just smaller scale from an industrial or commercial laundry perspective. So they're still going to have lots of solids. Uh, they can have pH issues as well. Um, with industrial laundries, you get a little bit more issues with kind of oil and grease, like fog, uh, but, and even like petroleum-based oils, because they may like wash rags and, and various, you know, components coming from like auto manufacturing or repair shops. Uh, and in, even in some cases, I say municipalities prohibit them uh, from, from washing or laundering those types of, of, of things. But you know, back to, to non-SAU type material uh, type industrial users, laundromat, dry cleaners. Dry cleaners is really more from a chemical perspective. Um, you know, they don't really generate wastewater per se, but they just really have some nasty chemicals um, on site that are that are you know somewhat concerning. Um, car wash facilities, so you know your kind of typical like drive-through car wash. Um, they do a pretty high volume a lot of times, and they can have some, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of grease, oils um, coming from off of the vehicles, a lot of grime, solids um, that are coming from the vehicles as well. Um, and so, from a BMP perspective, generally speaking, you're looking at like a uh, old water separator that's going to settle out solids as well. Um, industrial vehicle washing. So this is more like, um, I can give you a couple good examples. Uh, being in Memphis, we are the world headquarters for FedEx. Um, and so there are like a, a thousand FedEx distribution facilities in Memphis. And um, whether it's FedEx Ground or FedEx Express, you know, they all have their, at their facilities, they all have these drive-through car washes. Uh, that their trucks can run through and, and wash their cars. And we used to permit them all as SIUs. Um, and, and just to be honest with you, they didn't, their discharges were relatively benign. They were somewhat high in solids, somewhat high in oil and grease, but their volumes were just so low. And as long as they maintain their oil water separators, um, there, were, there were usually no problems. And so we actually declassified them as SIUs uh, several years ago. But I say all that to say that they, they definitely have some potential to cause some problems, especially if their oil water separators aren't, aren't working properly. Um, auto repair shops is another one. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I can't tell, like I've seen physically firsthand um, people at auto repair shops just changing oil and letting it run down, you know, into the storm drain. Um, we actually took some a pretty substantial enforcement case against uh, some facilities in Memphis that were doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but auto repair shops, you know, you, uh, they have a high, a, a high potential for discharging oil and grease, obviously, because they're, they're changing a lot of uh, oil, um, coolant materials. They are uh, servicing equipment. So, so the auto repair shops are definitely one that uh, probably probably one of the most prevalent non-SIU BMP permit that, I, that I've run across. Uh, hospital, uh, healthcare facilities, probably should have, you know, maybe lumped and bombing into that. Um, but, you know, definitely those types of facilities can, can, have some, uh, uh, can have some discharges that are, you know, relatively um, dirty. You saw the pictures earlier from the healthcare facilities, the rags, the wipes, the gloves things like that. <coughs> Silver dischargers. Um, so this is really, you know, kind of gone away with time. Um, but but with the silver dischargers, you know, the fixer, the developer style of, um, of you know, film manufacturing, let's call it, uh, x-rays were probably one of the most um, common um, that, that where we would see the uh, uh, the silver being generated, so they would generally be able to capture the you know have silver uh, recovery systems and, and capture that. But you know I think someone mentioned yesterday there's still a few of those around. I actually I inspected a huge. Um, um, it, it's amazing actually. It was it's a it was a it was in California. It was a hazardous waste um, 
faci uh, treatment facility that all they treated was fit, all they t accepted was fixer and developer uh, solution, used fixer and developer solutions uh, from various uh, facilities in, in California. And um, I mean, it was like massive, like how the volume of like fixers and developers were coming in in drums and totes. I mean, they had just thousands and thousands of gallons on a daily basis that they were treating uh, to remove the um, uh, silver, um, you know, adjust the pH and, and then actually discharge the wastewater to the sewer and then uh, captured the silver and actually sold it uh, as scrap metal. Um, construction dewatering sites. So I say that I know you're all in Arizona. Some, some areas of Arizona don't get as much rain as, as other parts. Um, but uh, I have seen a lot of construction dewatering sites um, that get perm that get kind of these special uh, temporary discharge permits um, to, to dewater. Like, for example, they'll have a huge hole in the ground where they're constructing something and it rains and uh, now their huge hole is a pond and they have to get rid of it. And so uh, or it could be groundwater intrusion even. But um, a lot of times cities will allow them to discharge that to the sewer through kind of these temporary BMP permits uh, where they're basically allowing all that, you know, maybe they're using uh, flocculants, different chemicals, maybe to settle out the solids uh, and then discharge that. Uh, to the to the sewer, and then kind of finally, I'll I lump in waste haulers, food service establishments, because that's really a, a most in most cases kind of a BMP non SIU style of regulation. Um, uh, waste haulers sometimes we actually do permit them and and treat them as SIU. So don't take this as you shouldn't permit your waste haulers as SIUs because there's there's definitely good reasons and justifications for doing that. I, I just say most of the facilities that I've been to don't treat their waste haulers as SIUs. Um, and then I throw this last one in there because this is really important for you all. And 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 so the the when I worked uh, as a contractor for EPA, uh, the the guy that trained me, some of you may know him, Chuck Durham. He's uh he's been around for a long time doing pretreatment work and uh, uh, just tremendous wealth of knowledge. And he's always told me. He said, he said, I always try to go to jewelry repair shops because somewhere in your town, somebody's repairing jewelry and they're doing metal finishing. They're probably doing rhodium plating. Um, and and in, a, in bigger cities, what winds up happening is a lot of these, um, these facilities are, are located, uh, like, like there'll just be one jewelry shop repair shop, you know, facility that does all the jewelry repairs for all the jewelry shops in town. Um, so you can go into three or four and ask around and, you know, ultimately find where you need to go. But funny story, like, like a month ago, my wife's um, um, uh, wedding band had, had a, uh, uh, an issue with it. One, it had a little dime, a small diamond fell out of it. We were trying to get it repaired. And I went to uh the, the most like highly recommended guy in the town that we live in um, took the ring to him and uh, to, to see what it was going to cost to get it repaired. And sure enough, he was doing rhodium plating. And it, I, I promise you, it looked like a little mini crock pot um, doing rhodium plating in the facility um, that, that I took it to in, in the town that I live in. And, uh, and I just, I, I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was blown away by it. I was pretty shocked. I was asking a lot of questions. He, he probably thought I was like some kind of undercover agent, but, um, you know, asked him what he did with his wastewater from the rhodium plating. I, I told him I was kind of in that business and uh, just curious kind of what he did with it. And sure enough, discharged it, you know, just dumped it down the sink. And, um, you know, really, <laughs> really just blew me away. I've never actually ran across a facility that did that, but, um, yeah, just be aware that that they're out there, and they're if they're if they're doing rhodium plating, they're a metal finisher. So now they, I, I list them in here as a non SIU because most of the time they would actually be a non significant categorical industrial user. So if you adopted that as an optional streamlining provision, then you could permit them as an NSCIU and not as a CIU. 
Um, but if they're rhodium plating and discharging wastewater to the sewer, then they are a metal finisher. Um, so, so be aware of that in your, um, in, in your own communities. Yeah, you've seen a pawn shop doing crock pot rhodium plating. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, I, that kind of surprises me about a, a pawn shop, but it's definitely out there. So, so be aware of it. I mean, we're talking real small volumes, you know, like not even a gallon, you know, we're talking about real, real small um, amounts uh, of, of wastewater. So, and, and then I'll just kind of, I need to kind of wrap up. I know I'm running out of time, but um, when you talk about these facilities, you know, we talk about like, how do you regulate these facilities? So one option is a control mechanism, right? And so once again, I'll go back to, you need to know what your ordinance says, know if you have the legal authority to regulate these facilities um, through some type of a control mechanism. Um, and I'm not, I'm not referring to this control mechanism as an SIU permit. It would be, you know, some type of a strategic, uh, strategically developed, you know, best management practice, like BMP style permit, maybe. Um, and it's going to include a couple different things. You know, one of the, some of the things that you should include in any, any permit that you issue or control mechanism are the general prohibitions. So they can't cause pass through, they can't cause interference. And one thing I like uh, that I just ran across the municipality I was working with up in Oregon uh, just recently, uh, I, I was helping them uh, modify some documents and they, in their definition, uh, pass through interference. They also included a, a term called disruption. Uh, so, so the and I can I think it's uh, interference. I believe is that it requires based on the federal regulation. It requires an MPDS permit violation. Uh, and so they modified their definition to include disruption, which would be more stringent than the federal regulation. So they'd have the authority to do that by not, but it doesn't require an MPDS permit violation. So you could disrupt the operation of the treatment facility, but not cause a MPDS permit violation. And that would be a general prohibition uh, in the pretreatment ordinance. So something to consider when looking at your ordinances. Um, also just the specific prohibitions, right? So they can't, their waste stream can't be corrosive, ca causing uh, corrosive structural damage to the POTW, oxygen demanding, uh, can't be explosive, uh, could, can't be solid or viscous, uh, heat in excess of, you know, whatever amount you have your temperature limit set at, but definitely can't cause the input of the treatment plant to, to exceed 104 degrees. Um, and there's, there's three or four more that I didn't include. Um, but just be aware that, that those should be in there because they're a, they're a non-domestic user um, and, and so they should be held to those same general specific prohibitions just as a significant industrial user. And then uh, compliance, obviously, with the ordinance um, includes maybe some, you may consider including some specific type of monitoring requirement. So maybe, you know, instead of requiring them to sample, maybe some of those things that you have um, are uh, you, instead of sampling for suspended solids and meeting a limit, Maybe you require them to report to you quarterly or semi-annually uh, the frequency of, of, of their, uh, you know, servicing of their oil water separator or solid separation system uh, and require them to show you manifest and documentation that someone came out and cleaned that. Um, and then obviously specific BMPs, right? So uh, dry sweeps before... They wash down the facility to reduce suspended solids. Um, uh, cleaning the, um, you know, maintaining their oil water separator is, is, is kind of the classic one. Uh, but there could be all, all sorts of, uh, you know, segregating your, your different oils and coolants and hauling those off offsite, things like that. <clears throat> And then, uh, so yeah, so here's just some examples of some, of some BMPs that you'll see for an auto shop, right? So an oil water separator, as I mentioned, installed and maintained, that's, that's pretty critical as well that they maintain it. Um, uh, using drip pans, you know, to, to help prevent oil from dripping into the floor, draining all your oil filters uh, before disposing of them uh, to make sure that they don't leak 
uh, while they're sitting there waiting to be hauled off site. Uh, maybe you require them to not have any floor drains in the facility. Um, having a centralized park cleaner that's not connected to the sewer, that, that's pretty critical. And you see those, you see a lot of um, um, service companies that'll, you know, come out and monthly or quarterly or weekly, whatever your need is, and service those um, those parts cleaner and put fresh, you know, clean, clean them out and then put fresh water and solutions in them, uh, things like that. So just trying to kind of get through this. I think I got maybe a, a few more minutes. Uh, so, so I'd like to just maybe go through this scenario real quickly and everyone just kind of open it up to everyone and see kind of how they would regulate this facility, um, if that's okay. So um, I'm just gonna read through it real quick. The Arizona Dairy, and this is, this is just totally kind of made up scenario, so it's not a particular, I apologize if there's a facility called Arizona Dairy and Creamery Corporation. Um, but the Arizona Dairy and Creamery Corporation is a small dairy and creamery that processes raw liquid milk into powdered milk, liquid milk, cream, cheese, and butter. The average daily discharge to their local sewer is 9,000 gallons per day. The untreated BOD concentrations are approximately 50,000 milligrams per liter. The facility has dissolved air flotation treatment, which operates effectively most of the time. The treatment facility has had occasional instances of non-compliance with BOD and oil and grease when the dissolved air flotation system or the DAF is down or non-operational. The town's wastewater treatment uh, treatment plant has an average flow of uh, 0.75 million gallons uh, each day with adequate capacity for the organic loading. All right, so here, just kind of a recap, here's what we know. The average daily flow from the facility is 9,000 gallons each day, so the, the, the dairy the creamery is discharging approximately 9,000 gallons of uh, wastewater every day to the sewer. They have a dissolved air flotation system that's going to help remove solids, oils, and grease, floatables, um, um, and, and then ultimately also help reduce some of their BOD loading. And it's most re reliable, but it, it does go down periodically. They uh, historically have had a few issues. Uh, with BOD and oil and grease non-compliance, obviously when the DAF's not operational, um, they would be 1.2% of the total flow to the uh, to the to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, which has adequate organic capacity. So, just kind of throwing it out to you all: if you were in this situation, should the Arizona Dairy and Creamery Corporation be permitted as an SIU or not as an SIU? Feel free to comment drop a drop it in the uh, chat box just you know yell it out do whatever whatever's easiest for you I, I'm, I'm curious to see what everyone thinks if we should permit them as an siu or not as an siu Keep throwing it in there, Travis. I'm going to go and just double check 405. I, I believe that there's no pretreatment standards for um, dairies and creameries in that subsection. If you give me a second, um, I'll go double check that real quick while everybody's commenting. Uh, there you. Yeah, so I, I just specifically looked up uh, dry milk manufacturing. Uh, what's it called? Dry milk subcategory 405 subpart J. And uh, they do not have any pretreatment standards. Um, so, so what that means is, is that there's pro, uh, there are probably direct discharge standards. So if the dairy 
you know, had an MPDS permit and discharged directly to a receiving stream um, and not to a wastewater treatment facility, then they would be held to those categorical standards. Um, but because they are, uh, there are no pretreatment standards uh, for new sources or existing sources, then those facilities really are not considered categorical industrial users because there's no pretreatment standard. Um, so the way you would handle that is you would not treat them as a categorical industry. You would treat them just as an SIU, a non-categorical SIU. Does that make sense? Um, let's see what everyone said. SIU based on risk. An SIU at the concentration, big impact, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, it looks like SIU based on high strength. So I, I think in general, um, most people would either permit them as an SIU, and then I think probably the next most common is that we would permit them as uh, as a BMP, you know, some some sort, maybe not BMP, but as high strength waste, uh, non SIU. Uh, so then, real quick, I, I think I have like one more minute left, and then I'll be done. I want to just go into one more uh, scenario, and then I'll I'll quit for the day. Um, the Midtown Brewery is a startup craft beer manufacturer seeking approval to discharge processed wastewater to the sewer. At its current capacity, the brewery estimates that the daily discharge will be between 15,000 to 20,000 gallons per day. During the initial startup, however, the brewery will need to passivate the stainless steel tanks with nitric acid. The brewery has installed a 5,000 gallon equalization tank for natural pH neutralization. Clean in a clean in place pro processes will occur daily utilizing sodium hydroxide at 50%, sulfuric acid at 10%, and a sanitizing agent. The city's wastewater treatment plant has an average flow of 50 million gallons per day with adequate capacity for the organic loading. All right, so here's what we got. Here's what we know. The facility is going to discharge at most 20,000 gallons per day below the 25,000 gallon per day threshold. They have an equalization tank, but they don't have any chemical addition. Um, the wastewater treatment plant is um, pretty large, 50 MGD uh, with adequate organic capacity. But there's a little caveat that at start, prior to startup of the facility, they need to perform passivation of all of their stainless steel equipment and do something with that wastewater, discharge it somewhere. So. How do you how do you handle this facility? How do you permit them? You know, I think I think one thing to to think about is that maybe their startup um, operations is going to be obviously a little different than uh, the way that they're going to operate kind of long term. So how would you all handle this particular facility? And just drop it in the chat or uh, feel free to um, just to just talk out loud. Especially use discharge permit for startup. Yeah, so that's actually, that's that's good. I agree with that. Definitely permitted startup. They would need to collect wastewater and holding tank cuts depending on testing check for metals. That's right, Chelsea. Definitely going to have some metals potentially due to passivation. Passivation's listed in metal finishing standards, right, as one of the six core operations. So could be potentially metal, considered metal finishing wastewater as well. One thing to think about. So be aware of that. Um, I, I haven't talked much about that at all, actually, throughout this presentation with respect to craft breweries, but I've experienced firsthand multiple times when they start up, they all perform passivation of the piping of the of the tanks that they use. Um, and they actually do it periodically um, throughout like about once a year or so, once every couple of years, um, to recoat that stainless steel, uh, because what they all what they all say is that they wind up getting off flavors in their product 
Um, and so they passivate once they once they start seeing that they 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 try and repassivate all their equipment uh, to prevent uh, you know off flavors uh, in their in their products. So definitely you know throws a little bit of a wrench into into the traditional non SIU idea. But I just want you to all know that you know this is this is real and this is true, right? This is what we see on a daily basis. And so um, understanding and knowing what regulations apply and how to handle it. You know, really helps us uh, be prepared for when um, when these kind of odd nuances come up. I appreciate your time today and uh, participating. I know I'm, I went just a, a few minutes over. I apologize for that, but um, I, I wanted to to kind of showcase, especially that last one, because it it's craft breweries as we saw yesterday. 321 craft breweries we thought were represented amongst the the group of people, and so. Um, you know, the, the passivation thing's real. It's definitely something that they do. So just be aware of that. I appreciate you participating, uh, chatting, commenting, adding questions, dialogue. Uh, that that I, I appreciate that. And I assure you, I mentioned this yesterday. If you have any questions or concerns, you know, there's probably somebody on the call that, that's been through so, a similar situation. So feel free to um, feel free to speak up. The, we got a, a, a good roundtable coming up next. Um, so, so be ready to, uh, to talk a lot in that. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of good information, uh, and knowledge passed through that. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact information is on this slide here. And thank you for allowing me to, uh, to, to take an hour and a half of your time today to present. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, I agree. A couple of people said impressive knowledge. Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks for um, even going a little over time because I think we learned a lot from all that discussion and everybody has been really engaged. Um, so that's been great. Um, we don't have a break on the agenda, but I think after all that, <laughs> we, I, think we should take a 10 minute break. So we will start back up with the last, with the round table at 11.15 Mountain Standard Time. Um, so just take a quick break and then we will see you all back shortly.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with our uh, day two roundtable, and this one is going to be focused more on fog, bad soils, and grease. Although, um, you know, the topics listed, it's just kind of like starters to get conversation going, which we seem to have plenty of interaction, so I don't see that that will be a problem. Um, but we, you know, there's a bunch of different things we can talk about. Um, Dave, if you want to kind of lead the roundtable, I know, I think we have a couple of people from Swift Comply on the line as well. If they, I mean, I'm open to them talking about um, technology as well, if they want to interject. So we can just kind of see where this goes. Um, if you have a topic or a question that you want to talk about, just type in the chat where you can raise your hand. And then Dave will kind of, Dave and I will help navigate. Okay, well, does anybody have anything they want to start talking about, whether it's regard, regarding any of the Ecolab products or haulers or um, a, a new device or what everybody's doing with COVID? Does anybody have anything, hot, a hot button for them they want to talk about or, or, or propose to the group? Um, I see Aaron raised his hand, so go ahead. Yes, I'm actually looking into um, moving pretreatment fog softwares. Um, I was kind of looking, what kind of modules does everyone look for in software? And additionally, does NJB Soft actually have a remote inspection module? I could answer one question on that with. Uh, we don't use it for fog, but NJBSoft does have a remote um, um, area, uh, remote inspection module that uh, the guys go out on their tablets in the field and they can just they can fill the forms out. They're printable and they just interface right into the database. And uh, we use it for our permitted industries, for our storm inspections and for our uh, non non restaurant, non uh, IPP permitted uh, commercial industrial inspections. And uh, it works great. Richard, is there any reason that you don't use it for fog inspections as well? Because my primary reason would be for fog inspections as well as the industrial inspections. Yeah, the only reason we don't use it for fog inspections is because of the uh, connection with our fog program and our grease cooperative. And then there's a billing billing mechanism uh, that's associated with uh, with that. Um, but uh, we do we use a different uh, different mechanism for fog it's swift it's called it's swift comply it's the same same thing i mean basically it's the same application in the sense uh except their program is exclusive to fog and uh like there's no uh like no no room for permitted industries or anything like that it was designed um for fog like i like in the beginning when it was put together from what i understand and there's some people here if they're from swift comply they can speak to that um but yeah, generally because of our grease cooperative is why we went that that route. Thank you. Um, I think Randy, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, we do use the MJB software for our fog inspections. And with our tablets, you're able to fill out reports, take pictures, and um, you can upload your pictures onto your fog report. Uh, we're also looking at expanding that a little bit more. Uh, we use what uh, the preferred, we're trying to get the preferred pumpers program, which basically will allow pumpers to log in and um, fill out uh, information like when they pumped it, how many gallons they took out. They can take a picture of any damage or of the interceptors and upload that into the program. Um, so, but right now we're just using it as for our fog. Uh, you, you're able to upload, like I said, you're uploading your reports um, and pictures. It seems to be working quite well for us right now. Matter of fact, we've expanded a little bit to the point where we're going to start using it for um, the dental rule. So um, we're, we're pleased with it. 
Yep, um, Randy, we actually um, have uh, for dental amalgam, we actually have a, uh, it's through NJBsoft, it's a custom portal developed that will allow the form to be filled out uh, electronically. We made it, it's printable as well, but um, yeah, the uh, user could actually fill the form out and submit it online and then that would interface with our database and it would go to dashboard, we can review it, but we do have the um, option with all of our forms with uh, NJBsoft, we have the option to uh, make them printable. But yeah, it, uh, yeah it, it works pretty, like we haven't put it into use because we went out and just got the hard copy signed first, but uh, yeah, we do for like future dentists that come in, that's how one of the ways we're gonna, gonna tackle that is just have like an online blitz or as part of their application to come into the city be given that URL to complete paperwork. Yeah, we're going to set that up so there's a link on our web page that links it straight into uh, right now IT and security are looking at a way to do it, but uh, we're going to allow the uh, dental, dental to link right into the uh, MDB software and upload their information. Um, the custom portal is uh, oh, the way, because that's the same way we do backflow, we do everything else where it can get right into our system and uh, it's, it doesn't even have to get into our uh, our network, but uh, it can get into that. Uh, it can get into our NJB soft. But uh, yeah, there the uh, custom portal is is how that gets how we get that done. Yeah, that's what we're planning on using. It's basically going to copy that portal for our backflow program because, like you guys, we use the uh, MJB soft for our backflow program. Also, fair enough. Aaron, um, go ahead. Yes, uh, for the people that have the um, software, pre treatment or fog software, when you're making the scope of work um, before you actually picked your software, is there anything that you could have left out that you would want to include now? Um, now that I'm in the I'm in the prime time of picking out what modules I want and developing the scope of work, is there anything that somebody left out? Thank you. Um, Rich, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I um, I'm not able to uh, to comment on that question. So, you know, I, I was just going to uh, comment on some of the um, inspection um, workflows and and other things that that we've seen from uh, Lingo and and talking with our customers. But I think that 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 um, Richard's actually asked a really important question, and and I'll defer if uh, if anybody can answer that, if if that's okay. Sure, um, we'll cycle back around to Aaron in a second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, one of the things that uh, we've added afterwards um, that somebody might want to look at is when we go do an inspection, we didn't ask for a printable copy, for a remote printable copy off our, uh, off our iPads, off our tablets. I would, and that's what we're asking for now, uh, we're going to put uh, small printers in each truck uh the it was very inconvenient you did your inspection you went through it then you had to come back to to the office print a copy and then take it back to him so he could assign it um we're looking at paper copies we're also looking at now we're looking at uh e-signatures uh to see but that's something that we didn't ask for before, and we're looking at asking for that now. So that might be something that you want to think about, you know, getting software that you can actually have them print, uh, either print or e-sign their, their reports. And then you can email them a copy. 
Yeah, one thing with our software on that is we have the option to do this, but we uh, we generally don't. We could email industrial and stormwater inspections uh, right on the spot. Like we could we could email them as soon as the like from the field, and we do our NOIRs for our inspections. We do them on the spot and then email them to to the uh, to the user right there, uh, right on the spot there. And one thing to be cognizant with e-signatures when we first got into this software. Uh, business, for lack of a better word, there was a big thing about, oh, you have to have VeriSign and SecuraSign and all this stuff. When you sign an inspection report, that is not a document that is being reported to a state or federal agency. So any any type of simple PDF e-signature or any type of simple, you know, writing your name on there is adequate for that purpose. Um, when you get into the whole thing of uh, secure signature. You know, that applies to if you're reporting drinking water data to the state, filling out your annual pretreatment report, um, filling out, uh, you know, things like that where you're actually reporting something to an agency for the explicit purpose of compliance with something. And so I've seen a lot of people get hung up on this whole thing with e-signatures on inspection forms. I mean, technically, you don't even have to sign an inspection form if you don't want to. I mean, there's nothing that really says you need to. Um, but that's just something to be cognizant of. I mean, everybody has to do what works for them and their agency and uh, their model and comfort level. But uh, yeah, I would I would encourage everybody to not get so hung up on e-signature security with you know simple fog and industrial uh, or uh, commercial inspection forms. Um, Rich, you can go if you have um, more comments or. Or the other Rich <laughs> or Rick. <laughs> Not Richard is what she's saying. Well, I show Rich. No. Rich Prinster um, has his hand up still, but I'm not right. sure if he's forgetting to take himself off. OK. OK, so we'll cycle back to Aaron. Is there anything that someone did not include in their scope of work for a new software system? Certain modules, lab sync or any other items or modules? Um, I know with City of Phoenix, we're working with um, IPAX and there's like several new things that we're adding, which, you know, it's part of the whole database upgrade, but it's been taking a lot longer than we expected. Um, but, you know, that's just our experience. <laughs> I don't know about any other um, municipalities that are going through that too. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I'm trying to avoid, Chelsea, is uh getting the system and then realizing that hey we actually need two more modules and then having to go and fight to get those two modules added or whatever it may be that we're requesting yeah i, I mean we migrated our like from PAX to ipex a long time ago and i think you know our program has just evolved and there's more things that we're trying to do now electronically so it's just you know, over time things evolve, but um, whether we intentionally left something out and didn't realize till later, I can't really say since I came in um, not, you know, much later than when IPEX was first um, implemented. Okay, we have a question. Are you all performing fog, fog inspections during the pandemic? This is a good one. Um, and let's see, Richard, and Aaron, let's see, these have been resumed or they never stopped others. Um, let's see, Scottsdale briefly seized inspections at the height of the surge. Yep, I think a lot of people did for like at least a month or so, month and a half. Um, Jolene, your hands up, you can go. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, so we never stopped either, but we uh, we kind of wanted to know with other uh, entities too that 
because of all the COVID, you know, some businesses are struggling up and close. We've been trying to keep track of the open close part. That hasn't been too bad, but we'd like to know if anybody else is like struggling with like higher ups or city entity, uh, city officials kind of dictating how nice you be to these struggling uh, businesses. So we'd like to, to know if anybody else is struggling with that as well. Jolene, on the side of the city of Goodyear, um, we we're asked just to keep an eye out during the fog inspections of reactions and responses um, when approached, um, just to get the feel of the actual owners or the um, managers of the businesses. And our overall um, results, everyone was pretty still. Um, they're okay to comply as long as we had our masks and everything on. Um, everyone felt safe on the inspections, but uh, we haven't had any pushback, but our management did ask us to look out for that. Did you have any pushback about making, because I know some of our businesses have kind of suspended their clean outs because uh, to save money and stuff. Have you had any pushback with that? No pushback on that. Um, so most of the businesses are still compliant. Um, with their pump outs. I haven't seen any reduction in them, um, but we're still going around doing our rounds, seeing what we missed in the last six months. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. No problem. Yeah, in Tempe, we took a uh, hiatus from uh, fog inspections for a short period of time. Well, actually for several months. Um, because of the specific impact that COVID was having on um, on restaurants, we didn't necessarily stop oversight, <clears throat> but we weren't um, out there hitting the street door to door. For our other inspections, uh, we came up with like a non-contact uh, protocol, for lack of a better word, and went that route where we put a lot more of the emphasis into the preparation where we would contact people and you know schedule it out, ask them, uh, for their MSGP documents, for their NOI, NEC related to storm, uh, any shipping manifest weights, and then uh, we would do an exterior uh, exterior drive by, and um, we really focused the uh, inter like internal in facility um, scenarios to where they were really needed, and um, that actually worked out really well. And uh, yeah, we got zero pushback from industry or uh, or from any uh, any management in the uh, city on it, and. Yeah, we actually in uh, the second half of 2020, yeah, that was probably one of our uh, highest volume uh, inspection uh, inspection periods uh, uh, because of that. And a lot of those changes we're going to keep uh, as far as uh, any of the like the pre the pre research. It just forced us to really focus and summarize uh, and really make it make the process a little more efficient and succinct. But um, but yeah, so except for the the uh, fog uh, fog inspections for a period, nothing ever really stopped with us. Sorry for being so long winded on that. No worries. This is Travis in, in, this is Travis in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. We're we're in a little different uh, situation here in New Mexico. Um, I, I think uh, we've had a little bit more of a. Um, I won't call it lockdown, but definitely a little more stringent COVID restrictions in New Mexico than Arizona has seen. So we've actually had forced shutdowns of restaurants, kind of roller coaster like, you know, open close, open 25 percent, 50 percent. And it's like been changing um, every several months. It's, it's kind of um, like it's like a roller coaster. So we uh, initially, like most folks, we stopped all inspections for the first month or so. Um, and then we've slowly been starting them up again. Um, and specifically for fog, we've still kind of focused on outdoor inspections where we can just go and do the inspection of like an outdoor grease interceptor without having to go into the restaurant itself. And that's that's been our focus on those. Um, and we did a similar thing for our other inspections, like our industrials um, at the end of uh, the fiscal year around June. We had a whole bunch of them we had to catch up on. Um, and so we essentially with most of those, we just met our, our, our representatives outside at the sample point most of the time because a lot of our sample points are outside and just did our inspection exterior and, and, and kind of like Richard was saying, focused on um, a little pre, pre, pre preparedness before showing up. Um, 
And but but in terms of fog, we've really kind of taken a stance back because we've seen our restaurants really struggling here in Albuquerque uh, as a result of COVID. Um, we've actually gotten several extra strength surcharge uh, relief requests, um, and we have gotten some pushback from management on those. Um, I won't go into detail on that, but uh, um, I think in general we've had our FSC struggling quite a bit more here. Um, than we'd like to see. So we, we, we've actually kind of stood back a little bit on our enforcement and inspections, um, and we are really starting to ramp back up. That's also partly because of staffing issues we've had. Go ahead, Richard. Oh, do I have my hand up? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, that was an accident. <laughs> I meant to hit the chat thing. I think I accidentally hit the hand. So yeah, my my bad on that. Um, I had missed um, earlier. Where am I going? OK, Benjamin had um, asked about if the EPA will have the annual procurement report, like the electronic reporting. And I know um, about the time when like everything with WOTUS is going on, I think they decided to delay that for several years. So, um, um, Rich Prinster said, you know, it's not, it's pushed out to at least 2025. Um, and I don't know if that's specifically due to WOTUS, but I think that could be part of it or just, you know, reorganization. Rich, if you can speak on that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, great, great topic to, and, you know, maybe not uh, fog related, so I'll just make it quick. But um, I was talking with Kerry Johnston uh, from the EPA, who's really heading this up, and there's a number of reasons to to push it out and is generally, um, you know, good stuff. But he's done a lot of really nice work on the specifications for the uh, the, the reporting requirement. And those specifications have been published, so it's good news for everybody. And um, ultimately, what uh, uh, Linko is at least um, doing, you know, we uh, always struggled with the annual report because everybody had different requirements. And now we hope that um, things will be more standardized through this um, uh, EPA form. Uh, whether the states have to report or or whether it's a direct report, so um, uh, that that'll be nice for all. Uh, hopefully, all the software packages will be able to um, you know produce that report. We're expecting to to have that out by sort of the end of the year, um, in anticipation of of the EPA um, moving you know to that in 2025. But gives us a little bit more time to uh, gives them a little bit more time to to work out a few bugs, and um, us some some time to you know really review those data elements and and uh, be able to hopefully streamline that reporting a little bit. Thanks, um, Rich. Then Richard. <laughs> yeah, this time it wasn't an accident. Um, Somebody had brought up uh, WOTUS, um, and I know there's been a lot of talk in the uh, circles about the validity of our permits and our requirements, and uh, and I'll speak solely for my myself here as uh, as an individual. Um, the I mean, it, at least in my opinion, and to me, it's it's as obvious as day is. Uh, any of those WOTUS rollbacks would have absolutely zero effect on the enforceability of a local sewer use ordinance, because if you just even take out uh, waterways altogether, um, one of the uh, biggest pillars of the pretreatment program is to protect the public assets, infrastructure and treatment plant. And so regardless of where it goes after that or what uh, type of NEPTES, AZIPTES or whatever ZIPTES requirements that uh, you're under, that local uh, sewer use ordinance is a matter of local code and would thus be defendable and it would be nothing about uh, the environment or the water it would could be solely about the preservation of uh, you know public publicly owned assets and uh, the best interest of the ratepayers 
anyway, that's my five cents on all that. But uh, since WOTUS came up, I figured I'd throw that uh, that opinion out there. Thanks, Richard. I almost called you Rich. Rick. <laughs> my dad is the only one that's ever referred to me as Rich. Yeah, I, oh. <laughs> I don't mind okay. it. I mean, I'm just saying it's just by default. Uh, Rick or <laughs> Richard is, uh, yeah. but yeah, my dad would always call me Rich. Weird. Okay. Okay, um, some more comments in here. Um, let's see. I think it just depends on the state and the municipality, the counties. I mean, COVID, everything right now. But let's see. We have a couple of um, states and municipalities or areas that haven't had any kind of in health inspections or maybe suspension of the fog inspections. Let's see. PJ put health inspectors in our county been doing only virtual in the form of video interaction with FSC managers. That's pretty cool. Um, I don't know, uh, PJ, I, I'm calling you PJ because I saw somebody else call you that, but <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I don't think I've heard of too many places doing like video interaction at um, food service establishments. Yeah, most of, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I just wasn't sure first time I'll talk. Um, yeah, a lot of that information I kind of came when I was trying to do some outdoor fog inspections just to kind of get a feel for the level of interaction. It was very challenging, um, but they had told me that um, in a couple of the restaurants I went to that that since the start of the pandemic, there has been no actual health inspectors on site and that they were doing interactions like literally showing and sending pictures of thermostats and, you know, of walk ins and basically you know which sounds incredibly challenging but um yeah that's that's what they're doing here in Bernalillo county and to my understanding they still have not resumed or i have not heard different that they've resumed any kind of in-person health inspections very interesting um okay we got a couple i think i saw somebody raise their hand and i forget who it was um oh keith um you can yeah. talk if you'd like. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I had a question. I, I'm kind of new to this field and I've begun some, uh, you know, grease trap inspections and did this training called the interceptor whisper and kind of the difference between hydromechanical grease interceptors and gravity grease interceptors. And I know historically the gravity grease interceptors follow the 25% rule, but trying to figure out um yeah the hydromechanicals there's they're rated to how many pounds of grease they remove and so it's it seems a little bit harder to kind of um accurately accurately assess whether the pump out frequency is sufficient or not i was just wondering if anyone had any comments to that <laughs> um, it's funny that you mentioned the interceptor whisper. Um, Ken used to be on our committee like board. Um, oh, really? A couple <laughs> <of> years, but <laughs> I think he was our secretary for a couple of years. So, um, okay. yeah, we've seen all of his stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it, Richard or uh, Rick or Dave. Do you want to talk about that or Cliff? I don't know, Cliff. If you have audio. <laughs> um, Travis, you can go. I, I guess I could speak to it a little bit in Albuquerque. Um, we're in the middle of an ordinance rewrite, so none of this is official, but um, we're trying to write in the difference between gravity grease interceptors and hydromechanical interceptors into our actual ordinance and our fog policy because we've seen that exact issue where you know, obviously these people are putting in um, hydromechanical grease interceptors because they're supposed to be more efficient at, at removing grease and they can have a higher uh, grease capacity than 25%. Um, and so what we've gone is the route of essentially just saying, you know, based on the manufacturer's recommendations, um, we've reached out to several manufacturers and most of them are on the 50% plus range um, in terms of 
what they claim their interceptors can hold on the freeze side of things. Um, most okay. of them are not designed for solids. Hmm. Interesting. OK. Uh, this is Adam Belowski of the city of Peoria. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Yep. So uh, some of the experience that we've had with HGIs is de depending on the model of HGI that you're inspecting, um, it's they will actually have. Uh, so their outlet T is effectively your sample port. Um, so if, like if you're looking at a particular model and if, if you know what model you are looking at, it'll tell you if you have X amount mm -hmm. of inches of grease in here, OK, it is at capacity or it has failed. Um, and mm. it's, that's it. that's actually included in the specs. Like if you're if you're looking at different model types, like a sure GB 500, I think it's I'm just throwing a number out here. I'm not positive. This is like if right. it has more than 32 inches of grease in it, then this this is at capacity or beyond capacity or 32 okay. inches of combined total of solids and grease. It's at capacity and that is at your compliant. Well, what would be kind of considered the compliance point of the effluent T on that. Intercept. Right. Um, now, obviously, so if you're looking at, you know, smaller HGIs, um, trying to estimate well, how many pounds of grease is in this thing, um, it would be pretty pretty hard to do that, you know, but if you if you can get a, an overall volume calculation of, of how much how much grease is in, in any particular HGI, you, I think the conversion factor, and I want to say like 7.1 um, gallons of grease or whatever it is, is it, it makes up a or 7.1 cubic feet of grease is a gallon or whatever. I, I don't I don't know. I'm not sure on the math, but um, it's doable. So. Mm -hmm. Not sure how helpful that it was, but that's the info I have. OK, appreciate it. Um, this is Chelsea. I'm going to share like in our code uh, our sewer use ordinance. We recently updated ours and I really like what we did on our maintenance, so I'm just going to try and share the screen really quick. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, I know at least in Arizona, every municipality seems to have a little bit different um, language in their code. Um, some, you know, they fully look at the 25% rule. Um, they actually sample the effluent. I think, um, I know Chris with um, Fountain Hills, if he's on, if he, um, he could probably speak to that. Um, but we did add some kind of timelines or, you know, time frames where they need to pump like more frequently. We didn't used to have this in here at all. Um, so this is an improvement definitely. <laughs> Um, but if you notice, you know, they have to keep their records. They need to, um, you know, fully pump out and clean at a, the specified frequency, um, make sure that they're doing a, you know, complete job of it, not just skimming. So mm -hmm. um, let's see, Aaron asks, how do you calculate interceptor size requirements? I know there's like a fixture count worksheet that we kind of use. Um, I'm not sure if other, I'm assuming other municipalities probably have go by fixture counts, but that's not always the case. There you go, plumbing code. Um, there's PDI method. Um, fixture counts are generally the accepted uh, methodology. Um, just because of their backing by PDI and then in the IPC UPC codes um, in Tempe, we do what's called a modified uh, IPC code and it was a replacement to the old EPA um, plates of meals calculation and uh, what um, what the interceptor whisperer has uh, brought about was the uh, you know the resurgence of uh, what he calls the grease uh, grease production formula grease sizing formula and um, it's you know, I mean, there's there's certainly if uh, you know to me uh, that's it's an application by application. Uh, app, uh, it's an application by application process, and uh, as long as you structure in your code what you want to use, I think no method is really any better than the other. Um, the one with uh, with plumbing fixtures, though, that's where the whole pounds and gallons and the uh, orifice restrictions on the devices come into play, and then the birth of the 25% rule based on average average volume of grease accumulation before discharge, blah, blah. 
But um, anyway, that's my uh, little spiel on that. Um, I see PJ had, um, let's see, asked what percentage of fog inspectors are using sludge judges regularly. Um, I know in the past quite a few in um, the Valley have been using them. I'm not sure anymore. Let me see if anybody else raised their hand. We have Dustin, if you want to comment, if it's related to that or. <laughs> yeah, well, um, what I had was more along the question about how to kind of know uh, what a proper cleaning frequency would be for an HGI, because uh, they do have higher capacities. And if you don't mind, I could show what I, I have a, a grease calculator tool that um, in Oregon uh, we, we kind of came up with and ran it past the or our Oregon um, um, plumbing uh, head, head guys and they approved it for use. And it's basically just um, you have a, a low grease or a medium grease or high grease. Um, calculation for the type of restaurant and this is just in general gives you a really good starting place for um, um, setting uh, a good starting place for a cleaning frequency and basically what I found is um, most restaurants fall into the high grease category and then you take in how many days they're open per month if they use paper plates or plastic utensils silverware or glassware how many meals they serve per day um, and there's um, calculations uh, poundage calculations um, for each one of those uh, and it kind of spits out a calculated pounds of grease generated per month and then you go to the type of um, HGI that it is and uh, you can find out how much those are rated to hold and that's just a really good starting point for establishing those initial cleaning frequencies. And generally speaking, those things need to be cleaned uh, once every once a week to once every two weeks, not once every three months, like 90% of the restaurants in my jurisdiction do. So uh, I can I can email that calculation to anybody who would like it um, I can put my com or my contact info in the chat if anyone's interested um Richard uh, is my hand up again <laughs> uh, I don't know I left it up from the last time I'm sorry sorry This is Adam Belowski again, City of Peoria. Um, so currently, uh, when we are sizing HGIs, we, we have adopted a grease production method along with your, so you, you have two components of that sizing methodology. So the PDIG 101 will get you your flow rate. And then the second half of that uh, is a storage capacity, which we have adopted a, a grease production method. Um, I know um, some, some companies have, they are using that as well, the uh, grease production method. I believe it's based off of a uh, Kennedy Jenks study that was done back in 2002, 2004, or something like that. I don't have the exact uh, study in front of me, but I, I, it's. And we have found um, that it's pretty accurate. I mean, it's it's not perfect, and a, lo a lot of your larger HCIs, as was mentioned before, they don't do real well with, on the solid side of things. Um, there are, are some point of use units that we're actually looking at implementing uh, for solid separation. Um, your gravity grease interceptors do particularly well with solids. Um, I'm more of the mindset of solids are the kitchen staff's problem. Um, grease is my issue. Yeah, so I, I, it's uh, um, so when it comes to sizing, the, the, the methods we've used have been proving to be good, uh, accurate. You know, so if I go out there and I want to do a 90 day pumping schedule on a HGI, a larger HGI, um, when I go out there in 90 days, yeah, it's, it's about due. Um, you know, that's not always the case, especially if the engineering team has, you know, sandbagged some of their calculations uh, in the, on the plan review side of things. Um, and that does happen. Um, you know, I recently had a Starbucks say they only had, I think we'll get a good chuckle here. Starbucks said they only had 100 customers per day. Um, so I, I don't know of any Starbucks in the world that only gets 100 customers per day, um, but maybe. 
Um, so it just it, it starts at the plan review phase all the way out until on the compliance set of thing when you're inspecting it after in the ground. But we have found the grease production and flow rate is uh, accurate storage or accurate calculation method. Ooh, sorry, I had to take a drink of water. Um, let's see, what else do we have in the chat? A lot of people interested in hearing um, what Dustin had. Um, let's see, what have we not talked about? We only have about five minutes left. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> has... Now I'm I'm kind of curious. I don't know how you would track this or just compare over the years, but has anybody had um, more incidents of maybe illegal dumping or SSOs in residential areas um, over the last year since the start of COVID? Or we could let's see. Travis just said I'm interested to hear about the EcoLab products. Um, I think Chris Kirillik brought that up, but I think he might have dropped out early. So I don't see. Oh, okay, never mind. Sorry. Do so you want to talk about the Equal Lab? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share what I had been, uh, and I've been talking about this for years, as I, I mentioned before in my email. Um, I noticed several years ago that. Um, if, if there's a if there's a restaurant that's using an Eco Lab products and they're renting the product or renting the equipment rather than actually purchasing a, uh, a dishwasher and other stuff that when it's rented, there's a, a like a contract they have with Ecolab where Ecolab sets the settings. And what they're doing is they're doing it to make sure that there's no food that's left on the dishes. They're worried about kind of especially things like dried egg and whatnot because it makes them look bad that their product doesn't work well if they don't have it. So it seems like the salespeople just overdose the settings uh, and then their dishes are clean, but every time there's a place that's rented, uh, you open up the interceptor and the third chamber has a sort of a milky white look to it. Um, and they always got higher uh, fog readings. And what we do is we don't do any of the sludge judge or measuring the blankets or anything. In Fountain Hills, we have a 100 milligram per liter discharge limit. So I just, whether it's a trap or an interceptor, I just sample what's going out the back end of it and find out how long it's been since they were pumped and however long it takes you to get to 100 milligrams per liter, that's how often you're going to pump. Uh, but it makes it really difficult when there's an Ecolab product because like from, you know, I've done it where it's been like, you know, within a week and they're like twice our limit because it's not settling out because it's emulsifying through all three chambers. And I think there's been some of this, I've, I kind of remember sort of, uh, anecdotally from 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 attending the fog meetings over the years i think other people have noticed it as well i don't know um how often anyone's really paid attention to that or tried to document it i i first started noticing it with the wendy's several years ago but i've had other issues too where i've talked to, to places and and seen the same issues and then i've talked to like the restaurant managers and i said well let me guess are you you have an eco lab are you you're probably renting aren't you and they're like yeah we are how'd you know that so there seems to be something with that, and I don't know if there's anything that we could. I just kind of wanted to raise awareness of that, uh, that we could all sort of look at that, and if it's some way we could start kind of getting some pushback on Ecolab and how they do business in terms of that. That you know there has to be something in there to say if if, you, if you're overdosing an interceptor, that's going to cause a, uh, an exceedance of a discharge into a, a public sewer system. There should be some sort of a prohibition or some kind of price to pay for that. That's all I got. Sorry, I'm madly uh, typing over here. <laughs> um, so I had put, um, we've definitely seen this before with um, facilities that have that power wash sink. It's kind of, um, that's I think what I saw Wendy's, the power wash. That's the first time yes. I, saw it, but I've seen it in other places too. Yeah, I, we've, I think we saw it at a Taco Bell. Um, we've seen it. I think IHOP might have, I'm not, I can't remember if IHOP had that or not, but they did use Ecolab, or I think they used Ecolab. Um, Ashley. Dependent mom and pop restaurants up here in Fountain Hills. I mean, it's, 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 it's Ecolab. It doesn't have to be the power wash. It's just any rental of an Ecolab 
the salespeople just, and I remember talking to a sales guy and he basically said, yeah, we just, we got to make sure there's no egg on there. They, they serve breakfast. We can't have that. <laughs> oh boy. Um, Ashley put, you know, she's gone at it with Ecolab when she worked in <laughs> California. They overdosed their prize causing passer and freeze control devices. Um, Can you hear me, Chelsea? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually worked with, I can't, it's been several years. I don't remember which uh, FSC it was, but I worked with them on dosing for their Ecolab products. Um, and those products, it seems like they overdose by like 10 times because we whittled it down. It was a um, dishwasher detergent. It was that solid block. I think it's the power wash one. Um, and we whittled it down to the point where the interceptor didn't get any pass through, but it wasn't washing their dishes. I'm like, so Ecolab was willing to work with me on that, but then they just got really intolerant with me. <laughs> and then the next year I came back to inspect that facility. They had already calibrated it all the way back up to where it was before. So. You know, we had, we had this issue with the IHOP. I remember we literally had a chemist come out from Ecolab to talk with myself at the time and my supervisor. And, you know, they were just, they weren't very knowledgeable, obviously, about impact to the sewer or what we were concerned about. But I just recall having that meeting with them. Yeah, they were.